Amy is sure coming back shortly. <clears throat> All right, let's call the order the meeting of the Harwich Conservation Commission for October 6, 2021. Um, we have a number of items on the agenda. Public, oh, it, it, this meeting is also can be attended in person or you can access the meeting on Channel 18 Broadcasting or you can log in remotely. The login, remote login information is available on the website for anybody that's, that's watching on the Channel 18. Uh, you can access it through that rather than reading through all the login information. Um, public service announcement, if anybody that's here would like some cranberries, there's a whole bag of them over there that were just picked from the from the Bell's Neck bog, which the town owns. Um, and the, the bog is also available for public access. If anyone would like to go down there and pick your own, it's um, it's right off of Depot Street. If you go down the road that head, leads to the Herring Run on the right hand, on the left hand side rather, um, you can park and walk around the far side of the bog and get access to the bog itself rather than jumping over ditches. And it, they're, they're perfect right now. They're really good. Thank so um, anybody that's interested in that, feel free. It's uh, town-owned property and town-owned bog, so public access is available. So on the agenda tonight, um, we have a number of issues, as I mentioned. Uh, we'll start off, the first item on the agenda is a request for determination of applicability for 87 Punkhorn, Dro Punkhorn Road, Map 100, Parcel A6, for a new foundation under an existing dwelling. Do we have a pro pro on? Hi, that's me. Okay, if you could just step I'll up to either the table or the podium, whatever you prefer. And I'll try the table, thank you. Okay, and just announce uh, your name and... My name is Sean Smith. All righty. Feel free. So these people have a cottage and they have a three course block foundation underneath of it. And it's not in great condition and they have a lot of rodents and uh, winterizing problems and all the usual things that summer camps would have. So they'd like to just replace the existing foundation with a four foot code frost foundation. And then there's some pictures of the different sides of the building there. You can see the block foundation that they have existing. Okay, great. But that's it, there's, there's no other uh, alterations or Nothing anything. Nothing unusual with the work or anything like that? No, no. All right. Amy, do you have any comments? Um, nope, this is replacement of a foundation under an existing cottage. The cottage is about 60 feet from the pond, but about 50 feet, but within 50 feet of a bordering vegetated wetland to the um, east, which is an abandoned bog. There'd be no footprint change. Um, they do have a limit of work on the plan, which I agree with. Um, I would, we would just condition, you know, site cl cleanliness and put on a fertilizer chemical prohibition, which is what we typically do when new projects come in front of us. Um, it doesn't look like they're doing anything of the sort down there anyways, but I would recommend approval of the project with a negative three determination that work would take place within the buffer zone. It would not have a negative impact. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, any comments? No remarks. Thank you. Sam? Nothing. John? No remarks. Brad? None. Sam? No comments. Alan? No. This is about as easy as they get, I guess, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no comments either. Can we have a motion on this? I'll make a motion to approve the RDA for um, 87 Punkhorn Road uh, for a new foundation under the existing dwelling with a negative three determination, I think it was on there. Yep, three. With a negative three determination. Yeah, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll uh, get this signed and we'll let you know when it's ready to be picked up or if you want us just to mail it and call us. Okay, okay. yep. It'll be ready right. in a couple days. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is a request for determination of applicability for six Meadowbrook Lane Map 32 Parcel X1 for the repair X17 for repair of a garage wall. Back again. Yes. Terrific. <laughs> this is a much smaller project, actually. Okay. Sean Smith. Sean 
So there's a block foundation again. It's in the rear of the garage. And there's also pictures of it that show the block, the cracking. Uh, it was taken at a time, there's a lot of vegetation there, but you can see it through the, the plants. So it's replacing the 26 feet at the back of the garage that have settled. I guess they had a water leak at one point, and the, uh, the water flooded that area, and that's what caused the settling. Okay. So the building is noticeably out of level there. All right. But the same thing, no change at all to the uh, footprint or anything to the building, just the foundation only. Okay. Yeah, and this is a repair and not a full new. Correct, yeah. yeah. So this work is, is pretty close to the wetland. It is about 35 feet away, but again, no change to the footprint. You're not asking to remove any vegetation other than what's immediately around the foundation, um, but it is pretty vegetated on the site. So do you in anticipate <coughs> any additional vegetation other than what's immediately around the foundation needing to clear? No, there, there is access in from the side. It's okay. already kind of a road to the back of the building. Right I to saw where, that, yeah. yeah. So, um, no, it would only be the three feet outside of the okay. broken foundation area. So, same thing, just uh, put a condition on keeping the site clean and have you put up a silt fence because um, no limit of work was shown on your plan, but kind of along that edge of clear, l edge of your access would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. And then again, the condition of no fertilizers or chemical usage within the 100 foot buffer zone. So, again, with this one, I would recommend approval with a negative three determination. Thank you. Um, Mark, Sam, John, no comment. Al, uh, I have no comments either. So, can we have a motion on this? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the RDA for Six Meadowbrook Lane uh, for repair of garage wall with a negative three determination. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. We're all set. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Have a yeah. good evening. Good night. Next item uh, is notice of intent for 86 Quantos Path, Map 100, Parcel G1 2, for an extension of the existing deck with a rent station, landscape, and kayak rack, and replacement of stairs. Good evening. I'm going to have trouble seeing you with the, the mask and glasses. I'll, so when you grin, you grin really widely. So. <laughs> a Phil Cheney, landscape designer, and I have Bob Connect, the uh, property owner, uh, with me as well. Uh, just to review the, the request uh, on this notice. Uh, it's a bunch of sort of a hodgepodge of a few things that uh, fall within the uh, buffer zones. Uh, first of all, would be trying to uh, build a kayak rack, a simple one down near the water, uh, where you can see if you've been to the site, you saw that some kayaks are being stored down there now on the ground. It'd be uh, advisable to get those raised up. I have uh, staked a proposed location down there on the level ground, and uh, if that's acceptable, we can negotiate that as well if, if necessary. Uh, the way down to that uh, kayak rack is a bit of a treacherous path now with some old worn railroad ties. The suggestion is to replace those with some stone steps to be more permanent and safer and uh, eliminate the, uh, the chemical nature of the ties that are there now. Because the path down there now is extra wide, a jumbo path, I'm recommending as mitigation for some of the work being go going on to narrow the path somewhat with some native vegetation on the uphill side to bring it closer to the, the four foot width that you're typically looking for. Similarly, we're looking for some steps to go up uh, below the, uh, the deck up near the house. There's a steeper bank up there for the pathway around the deck just to enable that, make that a little bit safer, as well as around the east side of the house, replacing some more of those ties as well as some more stone steps. Uh, the, other, the larger piece is the, uh, the small deck addition on the back side of the deck, on the landward side of the existing deck. And that's just to access uh, from the main living quarters uh, an outdoor rinsing station. 
which would be perched on the deck, you know, draining to a gravel pit beneath it, with steps down towards the front. And out in the front, which is also still falls within 100 foot, we're, uh, we're recommending replacing the, again, jumbo uh, front stairway that's there now with something a little bit better scale. So we'll be reducing the size of that, as well as introducing some stepping stones out towards the parking area and some native plantings associated with that. Uh, a couple of uh, invasive plant uh, removals on the, <coughs> excuse me, west and northwest side. There's some autumn olive and some bittersweet here and there. That would just be selective uh, pulling and or cut and swipe as needed. I think I've covered everything. If I've not, uh, feel free to ask some questions. Thank you. Amy? Thank you. Um, so we'll start on like the top of the slope up towards the house and I'll work my way down. So as they stated, adding some stepping stones and a lot of plantings um, in the area where you currently, where I currently kind of drove right up to today. Um, and then minimizing the front um, stoop, if you will, to, to the house. They are proposing a shed, but it's outside our buffer zone. And then on the side of the house within the 50 to 100 foot buffer zone is where they would like that um, additional deck area with the rinse station. Um, there's a tiny little piece that nicks that 60 foot line, but again, there's, there's structure farther um, towards the water. And, you know, the house is actually a little bit closer to the water than that. And I don't, I don't see an issue um, with that in terms of egress. Um, no additional vegetation would need to really come down except for a little bit of invasives over there. And again, additional plantings. The slope on the sides of the house and the back and <coughs> heading towards the pond are pretty steep. Um, so re replacing the existing old wooden treads with, um, with granite would definitely, and there's more of them, would better break up the slope and decrease erosion as well as the plantings along the side of the path going down to the pond. Um, they are proposing a kayak rack and when I went out there, it's in a, um, it's where the kayaks kind of are close to now and they're right on the side of the path. And I did ask Mr. Connect if, you know, to make sure that no vegetation would need to be altered in order to put the kayak rack in and he said no. Um, so it, it's the commission's purview. I do see the, that, you know, allowing a singular rack here in order to hold one or two kayaks. Um, I know it's within the zero to 50 foot buffer zone and, but I do feel like that is better than what, you know, people will do, which is just leave them, leave them on the ground there. And provided that we condition, it's just the one rack, um, no vegetation is disturbed. I don't, I think it's, um, a variance would be warranted for this minor, I would say, structure here. Um, the other op option would be if the commission saw fit just, you know, another not even 10 feet up the slope, it does get a little bit higher and drier, just as open. And um, that would be another location that would be still in proximity. Mm. So it wouldn't be too hard to get the kayaks up, but not have to go up. Uh, the plan doesn't really show like how steep, how big this hill is. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, um, I recommend approval of the project. Oh, and just so you know, we did hear back. Um, I did, I did reach out to the Harwich Conservation Trust because there is a conservation restriction on the property. The property is what about six acres? You said, yeah, it's a good size. Mm -hmm. So there's just a building envelope essentially around it, and HCT says that this, um, and says that this does meet. Uh, the conditions of the restriction on the property. So no need to worry about that piece of things. Good. Okay? Great. Good. Thank oh, you. And I, I should just mention that we do have an NHESP uh, yes, thank you. situation. Uh, we have not heard. Is that true? I have not heard as okay. of today. Okay. All right. We have filed. Sorry. You have the card there on that. I forgot about it myself. So we will be waiting on, on their uh, determination. Okay. But we do have a file number. Yes, you do have a file number. So what that means is we can't technically render a decision, but I think it, any questions or comments that we can fully vet tonight, we should, and hopefully just have that last piece be at the next meeting. So we'd have to would have to postpone this till the sit until the next meeting. Then well, what, pending the NHG. Yeah, you, we run the risk of like once we vote to approve a project or whatever, um, we have 
21 days to get it out. So what happens if Natural Heritage, which gives themselves up to 60 days, doesn't render a response in that time? 9.99 times out of 10, they have a recommendation that it's a, what's called a no-take, meaning no, no damage. Once in a while, they'll have a condition that deals with a you know, plant or animal that's on the threatened list. That's pretty rare. Um, but you run the risk of them, you know, adding something to the project or conditioning something that would drastically change the project. So I think we could, I would not suggest you vote on it tonight, but essentially get as close as you possibly can to that. Okay. So that hopefully that's the only lasting thing at the next meeting. Good. Okay? Good. Thank you. Mark, any com questions, um, comments? Stan? Um, yeah, the kayak rack, I guess specifically, you know, we talk about kayak rack and specifically what's it going to look like, <clears> I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm envisioning just a very simple frame, bringing two posts sunk in the ground with a couple of racks. Uh, ideally, we're trying to hold two or three right. vertically. That's so what just I would pick cross but I wanted to clarify it. I can mm -hmm. have you to sure. clarify it. That's the intention. Well. <laughs> Maybe we could have a basic diagram right okay I I can provide that if you wish meeting. okay right thank you that's all John, yeah, I, I don't have any time on no, Stan I, I'm sorry uh, Brad so in regards to the the granite steps they're four feet in length uh, most of them are yes uh, the ones on the east side of the house are a little shorter for three feet what is the width of the footpath looks like uh, it's a little bit larger. It is point. already more than that. Yes, so. it is currently, I would say it averages around eight feet. Right. That's a little bit larger than what we allow. How, how do we stand, Amy, on um, pre-existing footpaths like this that exceed our regulation? I think it's, I mean, the, Mr. Connect has owned this only for two years. Um, I think this has mm. probably been like that for quite a while. They are doing, they are trying to reduce that width, you can see by adding additional shrubs in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that essentially the width would just be a little bit wider than the steps. Um, yeah. And I think along that line, once those steps are in and secure, that will become the width of the path, hence the four feet. Yeah, that would be good to, you know, mm -hmm. reduce that eight foot span. And my, intake is, my intake is that's been that way for quite some time. Right. And that if they needed additional mitigation, that would be the, the first place to do it. Mm -hmm. But that makes sense. Extremely natural there. Yep, and and so the kayak rack we've we've gone back and forth on these type of structures for a long time. Um, it, in this case, it, how many kayaks is it? Two. Looking at two, possibly three. I think it was like maybe a, a stand-up paddle board. I think yeah, would be I, one of the. We would. We have two. We have two kayaks now, and we thought maybe a paddle board could just pop on the top of it. Yeah. So it's almost a you know. A trade-off between putting them in the ground, where it's dry vegetation, versus you know putting them on a rack. Mm. Um, I think that if if the footprint of the kayak rack was was in the footpath, and it looks like you you've got it in the footpath, then yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep it as right. You know, without like, without disturbing vegetation was the goal. Right. So it's already in a disturbed area. I think if you could move that up, as Amy suggests, a little bit to get it into a little drier ground and then have single four by four posts mm -hmm. to go in the ground, then, then we could debate whether that's a structure or not. It, it's, it's kind of in that margin. Um, so I think that's generally what, how I feel about that. Um, you know, trying to minimize that eight foot span would, would, to get it closer to our regulations would be good. Mm -hmm. That's all. I don't have any additional comments. Alan, any comments, questions? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I, I think the kayak rack itself is um, in this particular situation and given the, um, the width of that area right now, I think it's preferable to, to leaving the kayaks on the ground like they are. Um, moving it up versus leaving it there, I, I personally, I don't have any opinion one way or the other. I think if you want to leave it closer to the water, I'm, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a whole lot of benefit because what they've got, Amy, I think where you were proposing that they move it up to on the other side of the path mm -hmm. is where they're proposing to put plantings in. Right. You, I would just propose that they swap 
and puts plantings a little lower. Because a little bit lower, it gets a little wetter. Okay. Where the existent, where the rack and the kayaks are now. So it is, it would, like leaving them on the ground would inhibit any growth. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, and since you have to come back next in two weeks anyhow on this. To say, uh, sure, and I, I could propose another location there. Would it be easier to handle that in the, the pre-site meeting to, to restake it at that point yeah, out I there? Could. Um, I can hand this back to you with where I was kind of envisioning okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can. I can show it on there with a note to you know, make the final decision in the field at the pre-site meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Either way, it's fine. For me, yep. anyway. All right. Good, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I'll just ask a follow-up here. Sure. Um, what are the material? What materials are you proposing to use for the kayak rack? Uh I'll say and typically it would be pressure treated, but in this case, I think we probably would use cedar or, or something else durable that way. But even cedar, if it's, if it's set into um, continually wet ground, it will rot mm -hmm. relatively quickly, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of firsthand uh, experience with cedar post rotting us. Certainly not going to be permanent, no. Uh, I mean, would I mean, you suggest like an iron pipe situation be better? I know, I'm just suggesting maybe that's another argument for moving it up the bank a little to slightly drier ground, that's all. Oh, well, to me, ground contact is ground contact. It doesn't really change much, especially in okay. there, but okay. that's fine, all right. that's all. All right, good. If I could follow up, I, I think, you know, a four by four non-CCA pressure treated lumber might last a bit longer than cedar, mm -hmm. and I, I don't see a problem with that. But I, I still favor moving it up a little bit as described by Amy. I, I think that would, um, you know, reduce impacts in that close to the pond area. So I, I, I do favor that. I'll, I'll consult with Amy before I, before I go. I'll just give it to you. Okay. okay. Since we will not be voting tonight on that. No, then. you will continue. Um, I would recommend that this be the only one tonight that you continue to the next meeting. We already have 10 hearings for the next meeting oh, without sorry. any other content. This yeah. one it seems pretty straightforward. Yes. So, but I would recommend if we have any other continuances that you go into November. All right. Tonight. Is that 10 NOIs? A couple RDAs and NOIs. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Busy, busy meeting in a couple of weeks then, but um, okay. we'll look forward to seeing you then. This would be October 20th and we'd need a motion. Can I move that we continue the hearing for 86 Squamish Path until October 20th, 20th 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Bob, I'll just give this to you. And this is not to scale, but just roughly up on the side of the slope here. Not far. Not far at all. Okay. Not way. Okay. Okay. I can just outside, move these outside down. Of yes. The, yes. Outside of the four foot. Well, yeah, yeah, no, not across no, the four foot steps. Right. It's, I think it's a clear, yeah, there's a cleared area there with the steps that you could do, fit that in there. Okay. No problem. Well, I'm sure you did too, but still. Uh, okay. Wanted to make sure that I was all set. Next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for 25 Bellbrook Road, map 23, parcel X6. Demo and rebuild a house, septic, and appurtenances. Do we have a proponent? Might be on computer. Online? Yeah, yeah. I'm on the Can't hear you, screen, Dan. I guess. Um, Dan Crow, um, this is uh, a house. We're trying our end, Dan. Is can you hear me? Dan, Dan, can you hear us? Yeah, I got thumbs you guys. Up. Yeah. No. You got me? Dan, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up. I you can you hear know, us. We cannot hear yeah, you, so hang on. Hmm. Should be good. Dan, you there? Yep, you got me. Okay, you're on. I apologize. Uh, no worries. Yeah, the um, um, this is a rebuild 
of uh, 25 Bellbrook Lane. Uh, the owners, uh, George and Ty, and Tyra Seiler, uh, they actually own the, their house is across the street in Bellbrook, directly across the street. And then when this, they were looking at doing work on that house, but because of the floodplain, they were, um, they were kind of in a position where they would have to take it down and rebuild. Uh, the same to meet the floodplain regs. And then at the time, this much bigger property straight across the street came up for sale. So this is their current proposal. Um, so it's take down the existing house, uh, remove the septic system, and um, start over with a uh, flood compliant foundation and, uh, and go up from there. Um, there's we had the um, blue flag design. Uh, one of their specialists marked the wetlands and um, show we show the hundred foot setback from that, and we can we go into that area within a hundred feet. It looks like for about four hundred eighty four square feet. So then we're we um, show mitigation areas of existing cleared areas, one of them being the septic system area, uh, letting that regrow to um, two times the mitigation of what's disturbed. And then um, a new septic system will be put in more than 100 feet from the wetland and um, all the other requirements, five feet above groundwater and all of that. The house will be where the driveway is. Phil will be Phil brought in uh, about two and a half feet to build the driveway into the garage. And then the back of the house will stay at existing grade and the, and per the floodplain regulations, the, the floor of the, um, of the enclosure. So it's a small uh, basement or, or more like a crawl space. The floor of that has to be a grade on one side, so it will be a grade on the east and uh, part of the north side, and then the foundation will get the required flood vents. Um, so with that, I will uh, ask for questions. Amy, any comments? Sure. As Dan said, the existing house and garage are outside the 100 foot buffer zone, um, but within the floodplain. The new proposed house will be outside the 100 foot buffer zone, but in the floodplain, but the new house will be flood compliant. There is a small amount of clearing within about 90 feet of the wetland, but no closer, and that's really just to get access around the house. Um, that being said, I, I mean, the lot itself is fairly naturalized. It, there's a lot of invasives around um, the, the garage, which is poplar. So in the future, I would just say if this goes forward, that if you wanted to um, be able to manage that a little bit, come chat with me and we can discuss a methodology for doing that. Poplars grow extremely fast and tend not to be um, the most stable trees. So happy to have that conversation at, an, at another time. But I would recommend, I mean, with, uh, without much talk, um, I'd recommend approval with just conditions about putting roof runoff into dry wells, um, the condition that um, anywhere on the property, because it is within floodplain, would be subject to our typical regulation of no chemicals, um, no fertilizers, even organics, um, because that still has the nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, there are a lot of other, you know, if you want grass, a lot of other products out there now that can still give you a decent um, yard area. So, um, and then the condition that where the limit of work as shown on the plan does go into the 100 foot buffer zone, that when the limit of work comes out that you replant that line with more so of what we call a living fence of native vegetation. And that's really just to stop, you know, over time, stop the mower from going farther. Um, and and it, where it's only where it's in within the hundred foot buffer zone, not um, not outside the hundred foot buffer. So um, okay. Good. Thank you. Mark. How much? Mark. Tim. 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 Tim.
The only comment I, I had on this, I, I noticed there's a small triangular piece of it, a mitigation area up to the northern end of the property. And I wonder why you wouldn't move that down to the southern area of the mitigation and just attach it to two together. So rather than having a sort of a flag area that you're going to put in the mo zone, basically, um, it just sort of squares it off. To have we had, um, what I did was I took the area that was within 100 feet of the wetland to the south and, uh, and made that uh, total mitigation. And then um, whatever I needed extra, I used the next closest area to the wetland, which was up north there, oh. to meet the required 884. So if, if we add on to that south area, it's beyond the 100 foot from the, um, from the vegetated wetland. And it's if people went out, it's pretty. Everything's pretty. Um, like Amy said, that the, the um, trees are starting to pop up everywhere because it, it wasn't mowed at all this summer. But um, when we did the original survey in the spring, it was completely mowed and everything was, uh, you know, down at six inches. So, so that's that's how I came up with that little piece to the north was just to to keep all the mitigation within the um, hundred foot to the wetland. I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't have any property. Your mitigation doesn't have to necessarily be within the within the uh, um, the resource area. So it's up to you. Whatever's easiest for you guys. Um, so that. Oh, oh, and one of the questions. So with respect to the the area which is being mowed and the area which will be allowed to revegetate, are you planning to put in any? fencing or any sort of a boundary to keep people out of the hundred or I think that, that certainly since the summer um, and again anybody that was out there see, see how, how much it grew up on its own just since the summer and then if you look beyond what's mowed now it, it's kind of you know it's creating its own boundary it's coming in so thick um, so I think just the lack, just the stopping of mowing is going to, the brush is coming in so thick, it's going to create its own boundary. Um, there's nothing really, um, you know, the, the true interest for people that are looking for, to experience a walk or a wetland, it's down, you know, onto the conservation trust land down Bellbrook Lane. So even if there's, there's no reason to be uh, for people to be heading through that area anyway, except for you know. Well, when we were out there today, it was almost hard to figure out where the no where the mode area was versus the naturalized. So, so that's I know that just line. came over the summer. That we, it was completely mowed until uh, until the summer when they changed hands, and then this project has been moving slower than the um, owners wanted, but they they haven't mowed at all since they took ownership. Uh, maybe in May or so. Okay. All right. Good. Well, I have no other comments. So we have a motion on this. A motion to approve the notice of intent for 12, 25 Bellbrook Road uh, for demo and rebuild the house, septic system, and appurtenances, and with the conditions that Amy had suggested. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Next, we have a notice of intent for 49 Snow Inn Road, Map 15, Parcel N2, for reconstruction of his. Thank you. Good night. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, reconstruction of his existing pier, ramp, and float and dredging. Do we have uh, through the chair, Don Monroe from Coastal Engineering, representing the owners of 49 Snow Inn Road. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, let's see. Can I share my screen? Hang on. You should be able to, Don. We don't have you locked okay. up. Okay. Let's see. Can you see? My screen now. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to scroll down to the plan, which will be easier to describe. Whoa. 
what we're doing, but we did go in front of waterways. We had a meeting on site with the Harbor master and the shellfish constable and the waterways committee didn't have any issues with the project. Uh, John Rendon, the Harbor master, after you know, describing what we were doing seemed to be fine. I think he sent an email to Amy indicating that they didn't, didn't have any issues. Hines indicated that they don't really see this particular area. So uh, on the plan, you'll notice that the existing conditions, which is in the top section here, we've got a, an existing dock, an existing ramp, existing piles, uh, a railway system, an existing float. That float is licensed under license number 2937. And it was permitted previously and has been in for a while. The proposal, which is in the lower section, is to reconstruct the existing dock with new piles and new decking. Basically keep the same size ramp. But because the float that's originally there is relatively short in this direction here, and the flow is in this direction, the owner, the current owner, had his vessel tied up here and felt that this was very uncomfortable and not stable for a lot of the people that, not a lot, but the people that will be using the docking facility. So this is the reason for us changing this to a float configuration that's a little bit longer, but because we're making it a little narrow, we need this small section here so that the ramp can roll back and forth without coming off the actual float system. The float increases to a, uh, only, uh, I'm sorry, 25 square foot increase from 173 square feet for this float to a, a total of 198 square feet for this float system making note that the existing float, which is a dashed line right around here, we're not going any more seaward. So John Rendon appreciated that because we aren't going closer to the navigable air uh, channel area. So we're not, we are going back a distance with this particular float, which is why we're requesting a small amount of dredging, which is shown in this little triangular piece right here. So that the back edge of the new float to allow the roller system to go onto the float without coming off the float, we have the uh, three foot, uh, two and a half foot uh, depth at the end of the float and at, under the whole float at the at all time, all tides during mean low. So we also are keeping the same width, which is three feet. So we meet the height requirement above the substrate at a one-to-one -one ratio. We're proposing to remove the railway system so that that isn't introducing any more materials that as it deteriorates into the water body. We're proposing a silk curtain around the work area while the work's being done to keep the materials in localized in the work area. We are keeping the same distance to the north from the existing to the proposed float at 38.3 feet. But we are decreasing the distance from this float, sorry for the background, I don't know why that's doing that, from uh, an existing distance dimension of 89 feet down to 74.2 feet. So having described that, I would like any questions. Thank you. Amy, comments? Thank you. As uh, Mr. Monroe, Mr. Monroe said, this is um, largely a reconstruction of an existing structure with some alteration um, to the configuration and size of the float at the end. Um, also, the removal on the north side of the structure of a marine railway. Um, can you confirm, I, I didn't get a chance to go down and check, Don, is that still in place, that railway? It is. It is? 
Um, yes, it is. I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes, Amy, it is still there. Thank it's you. hard to see because sediment's covered over it, but it still should be removed. Yep. Um, my recommendation there is that you try to do a little bit of salt marsh planting um, in the area where salt marsh would be where that railway is. That's a small amount. Um, but that's a benefit okay. to get a structure to get a structure out. And then um, they are proposing a small amount of dredging. It's seven cubic yards um, worth of dredging in order to achieve their, their depth. Um, there's the same distance on the northern side to the northernmost pier, um, which is less than your um, required 65 feet. It's only 38.3, but again, that's existing license permitted and that's not changing. Uh, on the other side, you have well, uh, you still have more than 65 feet to the south. Um, when they did um, a survey, only two shellfish were located and not in the dredge footprint. In the dredge area, the sediment was found to be black anoxic mud. Um, again, it's only a small amount of, of dredging proposed. No dredging would be proposed within 25 feet of the marsh, so I don't think there's a risk of any scour as a result of this minor dredging. Um, let's see, they gave us the written analysis. I did get something later today from the Harbor Master and Waterways and Heights saying that they didn't have issues with the project. The original proposal, um, I think, went out a little bit farther, and, but again, that became it's Witchmere, so any change is really hard in terms of navigation out there. So they approved this. Um, it's in a conditionally approved area for shellfish by DMF. We did get a letter from DMF um, today, which I, well, yesterday, but late yesterday, and I put that now in your um, packets. They basically, they cite that they, you know, it's habitat, or adjacent to mapped habitat for soft shell clam and quahog. They cited that, you know, actually one of each was found during the survey. It borders salt marsh vegetation, uh, but they only had the condition of a time of year restriction um, for winter flounder. So not, no work would occur between January 15th and May 31st, because which mirrors a winter flounder uh, habitat. So in this particular instance, on this side of the harbor, in this location, um, it is not in a town map shellfish area. They're dredging minor. I don't see a um, environmentally a hazard to doing the small amount of dredging in this location. Um, would recommend that the boat, you know, definitely be docked on the seaward side of that float. We had a little bit of that conversation lately about boats coming in um, instead of parallel to the shore on floats being, you know, perpendicular and them because of that being closer to the closer to ground. So a condition to make sure the boat is is on the outside of the float. Um, but other than that, I really can't um, I can't think of anything else with some with some conditions I could recommend, you know, that I've talked about, I could rec recommend approval of the project. Alan, you want to start our down there? Any questions? I don't have any comments. Jim? You know, I have no questions. Brad? I've got a few. Um, first of all, you know, it is a pre existing dock, so our, our approach to this is very different to a new dock. And you're looking to do a little bit of dredging. I would like to see this project go to three feet below mean low. You may have heard that we voted to change our regulations to increase that 2.5 water depth to 3.0 and it has to go to town meeting so it hasn't been approved officially yet but um i think it was one of the provisions that had a fair amount of support in our public hearings and i, I think it would be beneficial at this location if you did dredge a little more than you're asking to go down to three zero so i hope you'll consider that um, i think it'd be better for the dock be better for the boat and the habitat around it um, Secondly, the, uh, I guess my one concern would be just the, the possibility of having some erosion occur on the salt marsh. And so our regulations say to uh, the dredging footprint should be 25 feet from the salt marsh. 
it's not clear from the plans what that setback is. <clears throat> do, you, do you have that measurement there? I, through the chair, uh, the, the one comment about the depth, we definitely can do the three feet. That isn't a problem. I think that would be fine. Um, we don't have a dimension, Brad, to the salt marsh, but I'm on my screen, you can see the salt marsh is right here. This is the edge of the salt marsh mm -hmm. right here. So that's existing. So this dock has been in for a while and that salt marsh is pretty much stabilized. So I don't suspect that the dredging, which is out over 49 to 50 feet away, would have an effect to the salt marsh. Uh, as you know, the Army Corps and DMF like to see 25 feet, but we're well over 50 feet. So I think we'll be, should be in good shape. And since we're not really doing any, quote, work in the water right in this location, the first set of piles is out here. So that will be from a barge during higher water. And so I don't think that will have an adverse effect on the marsh as well, because we're basically spanning it roughly, uh, I would say, 10, 10 to 12 feet to the first set of pile vents that where the piles are existing that are going to be replaced. All right, thanks for that. Well, if um, it, it does move forward that you do increase your, your depth to 3-0, you'll have to make that adjustment in the plans. And if you do so, if you don't mind going ahead and, and putting in that setback from the dredge, you know, the, the high okay. water dredge mark to the salt marsh, so we just have that setback in the plans. That'd be great if you could do that. Okay, through the chair, take, point well taken. Yep. We'll put it in the section view. Thank you. And my last comment is just on, um, there's, there's a lot of oysters on the old railway in the pilings. And so um, a lot of mature large oysters. And, and so maybe consult with the Department of Natural Resource um, to remove those during construction. Sure. Um, there's not a small Absolutely. Oyster. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of big ones there. And um, so it, it might be worth that little bit of labor just to move them to some place mm -hmm. in case where they'll survive. We will certainly work with Heinz on that and Amy for sure. All right, thank you. John. Yeah, so uh, looking at the plans, uh, as they're currently shown here with your two and a half foot dredging, it appears to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that almost all of the dredging that is planned is under the float. It's not actually on the end of the dock where, where you, presumably, as Amy said, you know, we, I think we would, I would prefer conditioning that the boat be kept at the end of the pier parallel to the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And it, furthermore, it looks like it's designed with that in mind. It, does, yeah. it doesn't look it's, like it would be realistic for anybody to leave a boat uh, right angles at the end of the pier. But anyway, with two, it looks to me like I don't quite understand why you're proposing dredging in the first place, or even the small amount you're proposing, since most of the dredging is under the float. And if you're keeping the boat at the end of the pier, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, our regs specify that the water depth requirement is at the end of the pier. I think it's actually, and, and correct me if I'm wrong by saying this, Don, your, your logic was that the commission has typically wanted two and a half feet of depth on all sides of the float. Through the chair, correct. And also the harbor master, because we, we went through this with the harbor master, that our first rendition was to actually put it out a little um, seaward to avoid dredging. And he said that would create a navigational issue for him. So we are trying to balance what his requirements are for navigation with the resource area by only dredging to keep the float in its entirety based on the regs the way we read them so that it is in the proper amount of water. You're right, the intent is to have the vessel on the outside portion. That's why the dredging isn't uh, much greater uh, landward. So it's just merely trying to balance the two uh, requirements, the harbor masters and the regulation for uh, depth under the whole float. Okay, I have no further comments or questions. Thank you. Stan, I, I have no additional questions.
questions at this point? Mark, any? No I, questions. Um, I have a couple of questions. And, and to John's point, too, um, it, it appears that your, your dredge footprint ends right at the edge of the float, and you've met your two and a half feet depth along the eastern side of that float. So your, your purpose of the dredging then is just to get the two and a half feet or underneath the entire float, which in actuality I think is perhaps unnecessary. Wow. Unless, we, unless we're sharp targeting the three feet, in which case then, yes, it would have to have a minor amount of dredging. Yeah, I mean, we, if you don't mind, I, I think we had a lot of discussion on this issue, and I, I think we felt that there were resource benefits to having a, a larger depth um, mm -hmm. under the float. The towns of Yarmouth and Dennis have gone to three feet, and uh, I, I see scouring occurring under the floats and boats in Witchmere Harbor because of this low depth. Um, there's a boat right now near zero snow in the road, and the bow is sitting right in the mud. That has a resource impact. So I, I, in this case, I, I know some people might doubt this, but in this case, I, I strongly favor doing a little bit of dredging for an existing structure in a harbor that has been silting in for a long time. So I, I, I think it's probably to the resource benefit to going a little bit deeper. Okay. All right, good. Um, another question for you. Do you know if the existing dock permit provided for any dredging or is the two and a half foot depth at mean the water? Our research didn't show any dredging for this location. Uh, we did do an in-depth uh, investigation, but couldn't find a, quote, dredge permit for just this location. Okay. So so we don't know if that buildup of the mud is over the last 23 years has uh, incre or decreased the depth that's available at that dock then necessarily. Right. Don't, really don't have any any baseline to compare that to. Okay. Uh, another question, comment. There's also a comment in the material that um, the dredging is beneficial because it will get down to more sediment, sand um, sediment, which would be beneficial for the shellfish in that area as well. Mm -hmm. um, so my question mm -hmm. is, instead of tar you're, you're dredging to target the two and a half feet of mean, to mean low water. Instead of that, how much farther would you have to go to get pure sand? About a half a foot. So the three so feet. So we would, yeah, we would meet the three feet. So I don't think we have an issue with going to the three feet. I think you're right. We were targeting the depth requirement. But that doesn't mean we wouldn't certainly mind a condition that says the dredge depth to be uh, three feet at Milo water. Okay, or or till you meet the sand substrate. Yeah, it's it's yes, it's a relatively I would say in this location compared to some some other locations in Weechmere, there's a relatively thin layer of bad material, but we could make it so that it's three feet and not disturb much sand sandy material. And even in that sandy material, there is some gray matter, so it would be beneficial for sure, there's no doubt. Okay, all right, good. Because I, I would like to see you try to um, get as much of that mud out of there. If you're gonna be dredging anyhow, then why not get rid of what you can uh, in order to improve the habitat for, um, for the shellfish that will be restored back in that area. Okay. Um, so you, there's also a mention in here that the habitat will naturally restore itself after the dredging process. And do you know how long that will take? That Most of the studies, Ernie, that, that like they do, the Army Corps does a lot of studies uh, in the New Jersey, New York area, and they typically come up with those technical reports that show about a year. Um, Pam's on the line, she could probably speak to that, but the technical reports I've read, it's, a, it's roughly a year of, I think we have an example of that over in Allen Harbor off the Oyster Creek where they dredged that and within about a year to a year and a half that that was you know, producing more uh, shellfish. Wonderful. Good. Okay. Good. I, I just didn't know what the what the time frame was for that. Um, so it's about a 14.9 foot square foot increase in size of the float. Um, 
And there's no intent to moor a boat on the western side of that float. I mean, there's, there's room you could get one in there, but with the dredging that you, footprint that you propose, you know, that would be an issue as far as scouring and all. To the chair, yes. So John Rendon weighed in on that and said he would do two things. One is to monitor the size of the vessel that's going to be on there because he's the one that approves those items. Uh, he could also probably do the same thing that he does with a couple of the other systems that are near the chain, closer to the channel where the choke point is. They, 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 he tries to keep those vessels so that they're not infringing on the navigational part of it, but also not trying to put the vessels in an area where there's not enough depth. So there is no intent to put a vessel on the landward side, nor the north, nor the south. The, the applicant made a complaint about it being unstable. So if he tries even to put the vessel on the south side, let's say, where it's the shortest of the float, he won't, they won't be able to disembark or get on, you know, get an on and off the vessel. So there's a full intent to pull the vessel up along the 29 foot dimension, which is on right here, as you can see on my screen where I'm showing. Yep. That's okay. this, this area right here. Yes. Okay. Good. And I, I'd forgotten, obviously, that, that John will be providing oversight for this as well. And he would restrict mm -hmm. any boat from being moored on the, on the landward side of that, I suspect. Um, those are the only other comments I had, I believe. Oh, I, no, I had one other one. I noticed, um, Don, underneath the landward side of the float, uh, of the walkway, rather, you know, you have salt marsh on both sides of the walkway, and then right underneath it on the landward side, it's sand. And I assume that's because of shading that, that's been provided by the, or that's been um, done by the, the walkway going over that stretch. How high will the walkway be in that area? Uh, that that area, which as you can see in this in the in the section view, mm -hmm. that area is roughly if you come across here, that's about zero right there. And the elevation is about five. So it's about five feet from here to the underside of the deck. Okay. Um, so yes, it's possible that it's shading, but it could also be that it's shading not just from the dock, but from the from the, the boathouse and the, let's see, what, what orientation are we in, north-south? So, yeah, so probably in the afternoon, there's not enough sunlight coming across over the building. But to the north, to the north side of the walkway, there's there's salt marsh that's also in the same shading that yeah. would be provided by the boathouse, seems to be existing, right? Yeah, it's a good point. I, it must, it, it's pretty well taken. It could be that it's the decking. Um, we are proposing to redo the decking, but we're using the plank system, but we'll be able to increase the width between the boards compared to what's there now, right. probably up to about a half an inch. Yeah. So it, that should, as, that should as, help. As you go south from the walkway as well, I see there's another structure. I believe it's a structure. There's a dotted rectangle there. I'm not sure what that is. Um, but salt marsh also has disappeared to just adjacent oh. to that as well. Right, that's, you're talking about right here? Yeah. Right along this area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's a bulkhead here that goes right down, it's a concrete bulkhead. Then this is all like um, lawn area. It's not fertilizer or anything, but it's, it's, it's like a, I don't wanna, like a causeway, if you will, where you could actually sit and enjoy the view. But I think that is also, probably contributing to shading, but it could be that there's a, there's a channel flow that's here too, Ernie. And that channel flow, if it gets ripping well enough and the, and the wind direction comes in the right direction, it could be causing lapping up against the bulkhead, which could also affect the salt marsh. Yeah, I mean, I, I would buy that, except that salt marsh seems to exist all along that bulkhead along there, with the exception yeah, of those right. three, three spaces. That, that have been identified. Um, and I would love to see if you would um, replant the salt marsh in those areas along with the dock project and see if it will take. Uh, we, we can 
would you be we would be able to condition it that way i suppose um i don't think we'd have a problem with that as long as it's not a condition that if it doesn't take it wouldn't be because of the lack of effort because we're running into the same situation on a project that amy knows about over on herring river where we tried to do some salt marsh restoration in an area that was on the bend of the herring river and those salt, salt marsh pillows didn't take well and i think it was because of the current more than it was elevation or lack of effort so we could try it i don't have a, i don't think the applicant would have a problem with that okay great i think that would be very helpful i think is if you're going to be in there doing the construction anyhow um it's just as part of the restoration work that follows that um if you could take a shot see if you can get some pillows in there if they'd, if they'd retake that would be wonderful and i think it'd be good for that um that particular area of the harbor there as well um any other comments mark if i can start off on the last one only with the salt marsh i agree with john's thoughts on not conditioning the project to um, have action if, if that salt marsh on that bulkhead fails. But I, I would like to see a condition to make sure there's no additional impacts to the salt marsh just mm -hmm. the landward of the, the dredging footprint. So, and that, okay. that, that could be done by having a two or three year report that goes to Amy and it, it references either photographs or the past survey. And uh, just, just to make sure that, you know, the, the as built shows the dredging footprint. And then we have a way to confirm that we don't have impacts to that salt marsh adjacent to the dredging footprint. So some type of condition like that would be good. Yeah. Makes sense. <coughs> All right. Good. Hearing no Hello, good evening. Yes. This is Heinz Prof, Natural Resources, Shellfish Constable. Am I able to make a comment or two right now? Yes, sir. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, the, the advantage of going towards the end of this discussion, uh, a lot of what I would have said has already been covered, certainly by Don, Amy, and Brad. Um, so I would support those comments they made along the lines in, in regards to this project. Um, the entire Wichmere Harbor is a shellfishing area, but it's not an advantageous area, the west side of Wichmere. The, the bottom there is very different than the east side by Town Dock and east side leading towards the the overlook there um, and the public has a very difficult time trying to get over there. Um, the dredge material itself, I'm curious where that will go. I don't think it's going to be of any nourishable content. Um, I like the idea that the oysters that are on the railway, if they can be removed uh, without too much trouble, put in a bucket or something like that, make me aware of it. The dredge material itself, if it somehow can just be, cursory looked at pulled out if they're shellfish i mean i don't want to delay a dead dredging project by days because they're sifting through everything there's not gonna be much in there anyway but if in fact there are any cohogs or soft shells or even oysters i just put them aside as well i don't think it's about not too long of a project um but all those other comments that were brought up i i would concur um don did make a comment of you know how much further trying to get down to some suitable sand or other type of material you mentioned half a foot six inches I would be pleasantly surprised if that did occur. Uh, many years ago when the Allen Harbor Basin was dredged, there was an attempt at one point to actually dig a hole in Allen Harbor Center so they didn't have to remove as much dredge material and fill a hole. But the test to do that, and it was several feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, they couldn't get to anything other than black ooze mm -hmm. in the middle of the Allen Harbor Basin. It may not be apples to apples, but when they had to go several feet and never got anywhere, um, I wouldn't, you know, hang my hat on another six inches that you'll get that in, in that corner of, of Wichmere. But other than that, I'm not opposed to what was, what was, was presented. Thank you. Thank you. Heinz. That through the chair to answer two of his, two of his questions. One was where the material is going to go. It's a small amount of material, so it can go to child's landfill. We won't need a 401 water quality cert because it's under a hundred cubic yards but we still have to make an application so that they are aware where it's going and there'll be a materials um, record tr transcript that goes with the trucker to child so that DEP can track it so they know where that material is going. As far as Allen Harbor, 
Heinz is completely right. I was involved with that exploratory dig. <laughs> and uh, we did a historical research, just as a side note on Allen Harbor, it was a former salt marsh. I mean, the entire thing was a former salt marsh that was dredged back in the late early 1900s. And it, it is a com continuously deep salt marsh uh, with lots of peat that goes down a long way. The difference between that and this is that uh, Weech Bear is a kettle hole and it does have material that's silted in because of the debris around the edges, but it doesn't have the same makeup as Allen Harbor because it's not a former salt marsh. It's a former kettle hole freshwater pond. Thank you, Don. How about uh, possibly sifting out any shellfish while they're dredging? I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. We will do that, Heinz. We'll, we'll let you know when that operation is going on. And if you want to come by, that's great. Uh, but we will sift through like we've done on other projects. All right. Thank you for your time, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Don, thank you for that history lesson. I think that was very, very informational. <laughs> I enjoyed, I enjoyed investigating that. <laughs> sure. was fun. Now we know why you couldn't find them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there you have it. I dove in Allen's Harbor two weeks ago to try to find uh, Larry Ballantyne's uh, centerboard in his sailboat that fell down the bottom. And I, I had poles that I was poking the sediment with, and I'd go down four feet to the poles, and then the whole length of my arm and I never hit hard bottom. And I, I never found the centerboard. And so my guess is it just kept going. <laughs> I searched for a whole tank of air, determined to you know, find it. And, uh, on. Uh, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, can I make a recommendation then? Yes, Amy. So I think the, the changes are minor enough on the plan that it, there's no continuation needed. The, the changes would be to go to a dredge depth of three feet um, to put the dimension of the dredge limit to the salt marsh on the plan and maybe make a note about trying to replant some salt marsh where the old marine railway is and then um, like right under the walkway where there's no wa marsh now. But I think um, those are minor enough that they, you could vote on the project tonight and make sure they have those plans in prior to the next meeting. Okay. Good. Just one question. Given Assuming we're going to the three feet, Don, can you um, verify that if the dredge depth is three feet, the total amount of spoils will still be less than 100 cubic yards? Yes. Yes, because the footprint is relatively small in square footage. And in order to get to the three foot depth, we're talking about less than a foot. So over that area, it will be well under 100 cubic yards. It'll probably be in the order of around 70, I'm calculating. Okay. okay, good, thanks, Jen. All right, can we get a motion on this? I'll move to approve the notice of intent for 49 Snow Inn Road reconstruction of existing pier, ramp, and float, and dredging with the changes, you're gonna to have to help me here, the increasing the dredge depth to three feet and what else? Marsh, uh, marsh restoration where the marine railway is and- Mar yeah. Marsh restoration with the, where the marine rail, railway is and along the bulkhead and uh, uh, removing oysters from the railway and removing oysters and other shellfish Selfish, yeah. from the dredge spoils. Mm -hmm. second. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Can I just, just ask the discussion yes. for a second? J just to clarify the shellfish transfer, um, you could say coordination with the Department of Natural Resources. And I, I think it would help the commission to get a quantification of what was actually moved. And so if feasible, quantify species and amounts. And then the second item, um, so we, we are looking for some level of reporting on impacts of the salt marsh adjacent to the dredging footprint. Modern, a monitoring report annually for three years. Sounds good. Could be yeah. pr pretty basic. Um, but yeah. yep. All right, I accept the, uh, the amendments. Can we have a second, please? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? 
passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners and Amy. They used to raise horses. Next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for zero snow in road map 15 parcel N8 B for a proposed pier ramp <coughs> and dredging. This is a follow up to a number of hearings we've had previously on this project. But it's a new filing. With a new filing. Uh, through the chair, Don Monroe again from Coastal Engineering. I, I, I kept the screen, so I hope that's okay. So, the filing has a number of documents in it. I'll try to highlight those documents. I don't know whose background. I'm sorry if, um, if it's bothering people. But this is an area in, in Weechmere Harbor. I'll scroll down to the plan that we sent to. Oops, sorry, excuse me. Let's see, where is it? So this is an area in Weechmere Harbor that is up in the corner where there is an outfall pipe that's shown on our plan here. There's a coastal bank that's right here that's relatively deteriorated. There's an existing set of stairs that are relatively dilapidated. And the circulation in this location is relatively low in terms of uh, exchange of tidal water. It does exchange tidal water, but it's it's somewhat sedentary. Having said that, I'd like to go to, well, let's just cover the fact that we, uh, we, meet, we meet the requirements under the Howitz regulations for length. We're not going any further out than we're going less than the 80 feet uh, under your regulation for mean high water. We're accomplishing a three foot depth through the dredging because there's uh, quite a bit of bad material that's in this location. We are making the deck four feet wide, which is in the regulation. We're also keeping it uh, six feet above the mean high water line so that it meets the height regulation of over the one to one. We are under a previous application, restoring the coastal bank getting rid of all the invasives, and there's quite a few uh, invasives. Uh, give me a uh, moment, um, let's see if I can. I don't know if you can see this picture. Can you see the picture? Uh, it hasn't shown up yet, but hold on. Can you see that photograph yeah. on my screen? Yeah, you can see that this is all bittersweet. You can see the dilapidated stairway. You can see the uh, material that's like on the shoreline. It's 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 not a it's not a great area right now. Uh, also, we did some. I'm going to skip around a little bit in relation to the culvert this year. We're going to make a few proposals to um, upgrade that because it is a problem right now. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple more pictures, if you will. So this is the pipe area here. You can see how this is broken off. It's just a mess over there. So part of the, and you notice there is some pretty good salt marsh right here. So part of the proposal is to break this, take this section out, take the next section out because there's a break right back here in the, in the salt marsh, and then have Seth reconnect the salt marsh right here, which will be in front of the pipe, and then just at the ground level on the backside of the planted salt marsh that Cecil will do, we'll put a splash pad, which we do in a lot of uh, marinas. You can see that splash pad right there, and then the salt marsh would be extended over into this area here. That splash pad will reduce the flow, also capture some sediment, so that, and, and then the salt marsh in front of that or seaward of that would also act as a filter because we have some things that we'd like to address while we're actually doing this project that I, I think really should be brought to light. Um, one of my staff, we did some sampling of the water because we wanted to determine where the contaminants were coming from that are in the sediment. 
So we sampled the water as well as sampled the sediment. And the reason we did that is because, oh, wait a minute. Let's see if this will work. I hope this works. Uh, doesn't look like it's gonna work, come on. Yeah, here we go. So just hang in there for a second. This was during a rain event. You can see the amount of water that's coming out of that broken concrete pipe. And you can see that the, it's relatively gray up in here and it's a pretty messy situation. So we sampled that flow because we, when we do sampling at marinas, we have to do it during a storm event. So we had a good rain event to actually take samples. Um, in the report, let's see if I can find it. This is, these are all the lab reports for the sampling of the sediment as well as the water. But we did a compilation of that for you so that it's easy to read. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Don't watch the screen, you'll get dizzy. Right here. So there are two tables with a, with a narrative. That narrative, we also uh, demonstrate to you that we are certified by the Army Corps to actually take samples of dredge material. This is the process we did. This is the actually some of the Allen Harbor samples we did when we did that um, dredging project a number of years ago. We have to also identify when the rain event take, took place, when we took the samples, and then we evaluate the materials and then draft up a conclusion. And the table here shows that in the water, which is this one here, the outfall, it's heavily uh, laden with arsenic, uh, benzopyrene, uh, fluorinthine, chromium, which is typical of most of the harbors in Massachusetts, but we're seeing this come out of the outfall pipe, which is only adding to the problem in this corner of the harbor. The corner of the harbor, you can see the corresponding arsenic values are high, corresponding chromium high, lead is high. So that's the reason for the proposed dredging is because there's in the sediment, because it's fine material, that fine material allows these contaminants to bond to the fine material. So when you remove that fine material, you're essentially removing a bulk of that uh, contamination as well. Uh, hopefully through the process of addressing the outfall pipe in the water, since we can't control the water because it actually comes from, uh, like Amy said on an on-site visit when we met with the DPW person there, that it takes all the water of West Harwich and comes down to Weechmere. And it doesn't have a catch basin up at the top where the uh, Evans property is. It is a concrete pipe that goes all the way up to a catch basin on Lower County Road. So the state owns that. And unfortunately, they just have an easement to dump the material, the water into the harbor. So the Evans have been gracious enough to want to do something about that because they also want it kept clean as demonstrated by some of their own efforts to clean up the area that they have a little letter that they sent in. But so this is, I won't belabor that, but they are making an effort to try to clean this area up, but also would like access for their um, future use of the property. Go back to the plan, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Go down to the plan one more time and smaller. Sorry, this is um, doing the best I can navigating this thing. So, uh, having said most of that, we do meet most of the criteria. The only we did put a variance request, we are 54 feet from this location in this dock. We are also 54 feet from this one. We have support by the two neighbors. We went to the waterways. They supported the project. Uh, John Rendon uh, liked the idea of us pulling it back landward, which serves two purposes, keeps us away from the mooring field, well over 65 feet. But it also doesn't infringe, if you notice, where this vessel would tie up here. 
whether this dock is here or not, they can still tie up there and this vessel can still tie up here without too much issue because this is pushed landward as much as possible by virtue of the dredging. We're definitely 25, over 25 feet from the upper portion of the dredge footprint. We are proposing salt marsh restoration here under a separate uh, permit that you issued. And we will be uh, placing salt marsh in this location. We don't show it on this plan, but the intent would be to extend that because we do want to address the runoff that's coming out the outfall pipe. We do uh, PAMs here tonight to talk to any shellfish issues that might be raised. Uh, there is a map in her report that shows that this is an area that is not uh, really a recommended area to shellfish, probably because of the contamination that's coming out of this pipe. It is fresh water as well as containing, like I said, some contaminants. The shellfish that might be found in this area certainly is habitat, but the habitat is relatively degraded because of the contamination and we're going to make an attempt through the dredging as well as maybe a, we could offer up some seeding of shellfish to try to use them as filter feeders to try to clean up the area a little bit better. Wellfleet's having some success in their harbors do, you're doing uh, a seeding program, so I think that might be beneficial in this location. Any questions? Amy? Thank you. Um, sorry. Finishing a thought on, on paper. Sir. So this project, um, some of you have seen previously, some of you haven't, um, some of you are newer to the board. This project was withdrawn in, in May and has now come back. Um, it's the same, really the same same project that is being proposed. Um, prior and uh, currently I am recommending approval of your project. Um, I do think the benefits far outweigh the negative impacts um, on this particular project. Where the proposed structure is going to be is not, it's down a coastal bank coastal beach and land under uh, water bodies or the ocean. Um, it is not over salt marsh. They are proposing to add additional salt marsh um, on either side of it. They're proposing to take care of, to the best of their ability, because it's the, the state's um, outfall, but take care of the pipe issue and address some of the contaminants if possible. Um, this pipe drains 1,700 feet linear feet of water from um, from Lower County Road through Harwich Port. And it's, it's tough because the state requires the towns to eliminate outfalls, um, direct outfalls into water bodies, but um, this is one where, you know, we've been, we'd really like the state to be able to, to handle their, their output. Um, but this is, this is a great offer as, as mitigation, um, I think here, what you're proposing to do. The material you're proposing to dredge, mo some of it is black anoxic mud, some of it is, you know, somewhat black anoxic sandy material. Um, mm -hmm. A few shellfish were found in the report, and I'm sure um, Pam can go into that if the commission wants um, Dr. Newbert to do so. I, I still do think with um, the dredging um, of material that I wouldn't consider high quality and the marsh restoration and then the shellfish seeding, again, that this project far, um, the, the positives outweigh the negatives. Um, the, one, the one thing I do have for this project that I cannot um, agree with is the, the benches on either side of the, the dock structure. We fairly consistently require that the structure in at, at be only four feet wide, and we have, you know, denied other people of similar things. So hopefully that is just seen as a small, small item, and in general, um, minus minus the benches which ex exceed past the four feet width, I, I can support the project. Thank you. All right, comments. Brad, do you want to start this one off? Oh, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> your perspective. Yeah, so, yeah, this was before us, I think, January 6, 2021. And um, it's 
So I've got a couple comments to make. Um, I guess first I want to go through some of the shellfish comments because um, the summary comments that I think were given to the commission at the last hearing was that it really wasn't shellfish habitat, and I, I guess I differ with that um, given my experience at the site. I, I <coughs> try to piece together, there was a May 14, 2020 survey that found five shellfish out of, I think, 121 samples. Was there a follow-up survey done after that? Chair, uh, I don't believe so, but I could let Pam speak to that. That was brought up. Oh. In, uh, well, that was brought uh, up by, I'm sorry, go ahead, Pam. No, this is Pam Newbert uh, to the chair, or, or uh, this is, uh, I'm a shellfish biologist. I work for my, I have my own company named Megalodon Environmental for the record. I've been doing shellfish surveys in and around Cape Cod for the last 20 years. I, um, we did not do a follow-up shellfish survey, but we did do some sediment investigations. Okay. And Don has that results that we can present to you. All right. I, yeah. I, thank you. I, I, I thought I saw a map in the August 25th, 2021, uh, Shellfish Habitat Assessment Report from Megalodon that showed a follow-up survey, but I can't find it right We now. followed up with, uh, there was a question, that we, we followed, well, let me back up. We followed up with a, with a survey to identify where the, to delineate the extent. I put my camera on, but my camera doesn't work with with uh, GoToMeeting. So um, we, we did a follow-up survey to, identify where the sediment transitioned from sand to black mud. Okay. All right. That, that's unfortunate because I, I do recall asking for a follow-up survey. I had gone out twice to the site and, and did some sampling and found shellfish presence and densities that seemed to be counter to what was reported in the May 14th, 2020 survey. Um, so I, I was concerned. I, I did request a follow-up survey. In my mind, it is shellfish habitat. It, it may not be mapped. Those maps are quite old, but there's actually a, a fair amount of soft shell clams along the perimeter that were not detected in the, the May 14, 2020 survey. And um, in fact, there was recreational digging that occurred last winter at that spot. So somebody um, found enough interest to go out and harvest soft shell clams there. And so, um, Again, I, I did not do a survey. You know, what I did cannot be directly compared to what was done by Megalodon. But to me, um, somebody who has harvested clams in this town for a long time, um, I found that that survey to be insufficient um, to portray what was there at that location. So um, I did hope to see that. In my mind, it, it is shellfish habitat. Um, and so therefore, I think it needs a variance. <coughs> Under our, our I mean, program. even if it, the state, the Massachusetts state regulations uh, or the performance standards state that even in areas with shellfish habitat, I'm not saying that this is good shellfish habitat. I think it's actually suboptimal shellfish habitat due to the due to the outfall pipe that's uh, nearby. The as long as the habitat can be restored to its original shellfish abundance within a year, then then a project is permitted, is, it meets the performance standards for the state. And since this project is not in in uh, town designated shellfish habitat, that's why we do updated surveys. That's why we do scientific updated surveys. And I think that in my experience doing shellfishing and in my experience working on projects that with some mitigation that's with the mitigation that's being proposed here, not just the mitigation for the salt marsh, which will benefit shellfish habitat, and the coastal bank mitigation, and the you know the upgrades to the habitat that have been discussed here, but um, also there can be mitigation in the form of purchasing shellfish seed that will bring this habitat after the black muck is removed to a condition that is equal to or better than 
than the condition that is there currently. For me, the pipe is broken and it needs to be fixed and this, this applicant is willing to put the time and effort and money involved. And that overall will have much more benefit to the shellfish habitat through improvement of water quality um, than the potential uh, loss of a few, a few cohogs or soft shell clams that can be replaced through a mitigation effort. That's my opinion. Yep, thank, thank you for that. And I, I do want to come back to that pipe because I think it's really important for this project. But just to conclude on the variance issues, I, I do view this as needing a variance to our bylaws. Um, maybe not so much the State Wetlands Protection Act you just referenced, but our bylaws, I think it does. It needs a variance to our setback, our 65-foot setback, and it needs a variance to achieve the 2.5 feet at mean low water that's presently um, not achievable without dredging. So this, this project needs, there's a reason that hasn't been a dock there before. I think this project needs a lot of help to make it work. I, I do think mm -hmm. that with the last hearing, I, I thought we were pretty close to agreeing that um, some type of source improvements to the pipe was where we were heading for possible mitigation. Um, just replacing the pipe <coughs> doesn't deal with much at all, in my opinion. I, I think you need some type of water in petroleum and perhaps sediment, um, a sump or removal device. And, and if you can get to that point, that like we were discussing at the last hearing, then I think you have <coughs> final benefits that would allow variances to those provisions. So I think that's really important. I'm not hearing that now. I'm hearing a splash pad. I'm hearing fix the pipe. Th those things don't do enough, in, in my opinion, to warrant variances. Thank you. Yeah, through the chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad, you, do you have more? I'm, I don't mean to interrupt, sorry. No, I'm good, thanks. Oh, through the chair, um, we did propose the splash pad before and fixing the pipe, but we were at the point of discussing other alternatives with the DPW director. We actually had an on-site with him, not the director, but one a DPW person and Amy. That was before we had the research done about where it's originating from. And since it's originating from a, basically, a, I want to say it's a state or a county highway, we haven't given up the idea of trying to pursue that, but to make it part of the application, it, there's a lot of things outside of our control. But having worked with upwards of 30 marinas that face the same issues with direct discharge and sometimes discharge from off-site location that they have to deal with. We have seen that splash pads with salt marsh in front do some work, but it, you're right, Brad, it doesn't do all the work. What would be great would be if there was a catch basin that we could put some sort of um, insert into it like we do with some of the marinas where it traps the oil as well as the sediment, but we would have to work with the state or the county somehow to do that. I think we haven't given up on that because I know Amy wants to try to pursue that as well. So it's unfortunate we can't make it part of the application, Brad. I would like to, but it puts a, a burden on the project that we may not have control over that we might think. But I also know that having worked with the EPA on the multi-sector general permits for marinas, that the EPA could be brought in in some way, shape, or form, but I'm not sure how to go about doing that at this juncture. So it's not really off the table, but it can't be part and parcel to the project, unfortunately. I wish it, I said, I wish I could say it could be. Unfortunately, I wasn't here for the first application in May, so I really, I'm just learning more about this. So I'll probably abstain from a lot of this. Okay, well, this is a new- Up through the chair, it's a new application. There's no, we would not look for any of the members to abstain. This is a completely new filing, and uh, previous filing is no bearing on this because it was withdrawn without prejudice. So I would ask each member to look at this as an application that stands alone. We're not asking for you to look at it, even though we've submitted materials that are similar in nature, we're not asking for you to look at those as precedent setting. 
although there were some comments made that I think are significant to the presentation just before this one, where the material in this location is far worse in its degraded state than the previous application. And the proposal for dredging in this area makes a lot of sense because it is an area where the map that's up on your screen right now shows that it is a, not, a, not in a mapped habitat under the town map, but that doesn't preclude the fact that Brad is right. It is still shellfish habitat by nature because it's land under ocean, uh, but the degraded nature of it really should be addressed. And this is the opportunity, I think, to address it because the Evans have stepped forward in a pretty gracious way to want to take on the challenge. Thank you. So we, we would ask that you understood. understood okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question goes to the point where uh, the discussion on the pipe. Has there been any attempt to have discussions with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation or the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection? with regard to whether or not the state can be involved with doing something with the outflow from that pipe? I've called, just to answer that, I've called okay. MassDOT um, a couple of times mm -hmm. and I have not gotten any response. I have not called um, Environmental Protection, you know, DEP, but I have called MassDOT. Okay, well, that's helpful. I mean, uh, at least there's been an, an attempt but I think there also needs to be an attempt to call Mass DEP in order to sort of respond, uh, make DEP aware of the problem and also make DEP aware of the fact that there have been attempts to uh, contact the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, but there has been no response received. That's the only comment I have. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, so um, I just, I need some more <coughs> clarification about a few things. Um, one is continuing on the outfall pipe. I, I must have missed a be here somewhere because I'm not sure I heard and can't find in the project narrative um, <coughs> in detail what the source is. Amy, you said 1,000 feet up to uh, South County Road? 1,700 linear feet of roadway from Lower County Road through Harwich Port. So it's all the drainage off that part of Route 28 and Lower County Road? Yes. There's discussion about it here, talking about you know 42,000 gallons of water in a um, particular rain. Yeah. I see. Yes, and, through and the chair. Uh, yes, there is a, there's also a plan that we provided in the documents that show the actual uh, location of the system that's drained. I'll see if I can find that while you're doing your discussion, John. Okay, well, if you can just point that out to me, that, that will be sufficient. Uh, on a completely different topic, um, I noticed when I was out there at the site the other day that, as Brad, I think, mentioned, that the neighboring dock, which is which is the dock for which there would need to be a variance for the dock spacing. Um, there, there are actually two boats kept at that neighboring dock, um, and they're not at the end of the pier. They're, they're perpendicular to the shoreline. One rather large power boat with two large outboards with a bow. Well, I was out there a couple hours before low tide and I'm not sure the bow was in the mud at that time, but it probably was at low tide. And so I, I'm just not sure how that applies here because you're asking for a variance for <laughs> spacing to the adjacent pier, but in my view, the relevant distance is not to the pier, it's to whatever is more to the side of that pier, which if that's that's a with 10 or 12 foot beam, then you've got another 12 foot less facing there. And I'm not sure it was, it was referred to a little earlier that the harbor master actually enforces or keeps an eye on 
and permits particular configurations of boats. So I'm not quite sure how that continues to happen there. And I'm not sure, I would like some clarification maybe from Amy about how that applies to this situation. That is the real distance is something yeah. different than the, than the phys physical structure there if the neighbor is keeping boats yeah. in a different way. And they may not suppose, they might not be supposed to be doing that. Um, that's an older doc. I don't know if the language is in our old permit about where they should be mooring their vessel. Our language and our regulation does read, no new structure or any vessel moored there too right. shall be allowed closer than 65 feet to an adjacent structure. So and they are requesting a variance. So it technically does say a vessel moored there too. Um, but again, should they, should the Evans be, um, this proper or this project be penalized because of somebody else potentially not doing something well, right? But I hear I, you. I understand that question, and it's not in control of the Evans, right. what their neighbor does with the dock. But nonetheless, it um, it emphasizes the point that there's more congestion here than first meets the eye, and mm -hmm. the spacing is closer and it's just further potential degradation of the waterway. So I, I kind of like an answer about how, what control there is on that spacing, whether, whether in fact there is a permit for the, for the neighbor to have two docks in the configuration that they're in, or if they're in violation of a mooring permit or a dock permit. I can look into, I can't answer you right away. I can, I can um, look into that. Um, we did receive a letter from John Rendon and Heinz and Waterways for, about this project. I don't know if Heinz is still, still on the line or not, but um, they did recommend approval, did not wow. see, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I can, I can look into the dock to the north because I, I understand what you're, what you're saying. Uh, through the chair. Um, John, uh, there's a plan up on the screen now that shows you this is this is the snow in road right here, and this is the uh, main street, and the drainage starts here and starts here and all pours down to these catch basins that are all connected to the concrete reinforced pipe that starts here at the intersection of Main Street and Snow in Road and then comes down Snow Wind Road and then cuts across and goes right into Weechmere Harbor. So it is a definite DP, a DOT, DP, not DPW town, but state issue. So I applaud Amy for trying to reach out to DOT at a time when they're very non-responsive. Um, I, I have some contacts. I haven't initiated any contact yet only because I'm, I wanted to know where we were going with this application. Um, I still don't know that it's necessarily the Evans responsibility, but I think it should be brought to light through DEP, which it would definitely be brought to light on the DEP waterways level, which would, we could make an avenue then when we're filing for the chapter 91 through Brendan, uh, the state engineer, that there's an issue with direct discharge into a water body of the state. So there is poss possibly an avenue uh, during that review process, as well as the dredging process, because that'll go through uh, the, uh, a beneficial use determination for the material that's coming out. So that goes through the state solid waste department. <laughs> they would want to know about this. And then that would probably set up some dominoes <laughs> um, that might force the state to look at these two catch basins right up here. Uh, see these two right here, up by station 157. It's hard There's an opportunity. It's hard I'm sorry, can you hear me? It's hard to see on the plan, Don, just, um, oh. but I can, I can provide the... that again to them. What page okay. in your filing is that on? If you can, I, I can look at it directly here. Oh, he blew it up too. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah. it's like 
on my screen, it says 134, page 134. But it is, uh, let's see, it's right before Wilkinson Ecological Salt Marsh Pillow insta Installation Protocol. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. There is an opportunity right by Station 157 for an insert here, possibly, and an insert here. Yes, please, science. Oh, okay. Um, so, in regards to this area specifically, I don't know if Pam is still on the line, but she described it uh, as a suboptimal uh, shellfishing area. That would be on its best day. Uh, in the last 24 years, not once have I attempted to seed in that area because of what was taking place or the material or the availability of access. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that then when Brad was there, he was able to, to find some. And if there is some mitigation to be done, I would recommend not to put it exactly at that location because of some of those runoff issues. Uh, I also, probably five years ago, tried to reach the Department of Transportation uh, because I wanted some history on that area and any kind of, it was a black hole. And so, Amy, don't take it personally. I never got anywhere and didn't get any responses either. Um, the idea that you know, that planting shellfish improves water quality. Uh, technically, as a sentence, the answer would be yes. But so would, by analogy, is taking a cup of water and pouring it into Sacramento Harbor. It does technically raise the water level. But the amount of shellfish that would be required to do anything even remotely detectable for improving a water quality, you know, area, it, it's it's enormous. And then even to get up removed, you'd have to have it, the shellfish actually removed to get that material or nitrogen out of there so if there's mitigation i would request that it, i would put it elsewhere in Witchmere harbor but if the only option is right there well then of course i would say yes thank you okay thank you any other comments sir i'm all set thank you sam um <clears throat> two things if, if and, and again i'm trying to look at this and, and it's hard on my computer to see this but i'm going by no Amy's notes are, if I read this right, they're, they're proposing to dredge to three, just over three feet? Correct. So one of your concerns, Brad, I think, was being addressed by that? Well, this is new dredging. This is not maintenance. So it's a different, different story. The other one didn't have maintenance. It wasn't maintenance dredging. Well, I guess I should say an existing dock. Right. No, no, but he's proposing to dredge to three and a Three and a half, three and a quarter feet, right? Three point three feet, not the two and a half. Here, right. Okay. But my other concern was your your comment about the boats and everything, John. Mm -hmm. I think in our previous presentation there, we talked that we thought that was under the control of our harbor master <coughs> there, and that would be controlled by him. So I'm not sure why some of the things that you're pointing out are are happening then. And that's all I have. Mark, well, the setback stand is, is automated. Right. Oh, I, I understand that part of it, yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, most of the questions I had, I, I think, have been found. Uh, just a couple of comments with respect to the, the distance and the variance that would be required for that. I, again, if, if, if John Rendon feels that this location for the dock is adequate, um, from a navigation perspective, then and I'm, I think I'm comfortable with with that being an adequate basis for perhaps a variance on the 65 feet. Um, actually, it's 65 on both sides of it. It looks like as well, correct? Don, there's a, the variance is required 65 on both sides. Yes. It's, it's 54 C present. Correct. As proposed. Um, yes. I, the, the other thing with respect to all the discussion about the outflow pipe, um, 
you know, it's been mentioned that there, people are still shellfishing in there. From what I'm reading in, in the documentation here, there's some comments that even if someone were able to find shellfish in that area, the good chances as due to their nature, they could very well be contaminated because of the, what's in the water there with the outflow from that. So it's, the presence is not necessarily offset by the fact that, that it's not a, um, a healthy environment for shellfish if they are found in, their, in that location. And I, I guess from my perspective, the, the proposals that have been made to put in the catch basin, um, uh, the splash pad rather, and to have the salt marsh, which would act as you know, some, a marginal filter, I guess, for, for outflows, is still better than nothing. Um, and, and I think that uh, overall, the improvements that are being made to this site as a result of this project, from my perspective, um, with the dredging, getting rid of some of the muck that's in this corner, uh, hopefully improving the habitat a little bit better as, as best as can be done, short of getting help from the DOT on this, um, would weigh in favor of, of approval of this. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's not often that we see a site in Winchmere where a project that's being proposed is, I think, better than what's there now. And, and from my perspective, I think this one meets that test. Um, so with that, let me ask if there are any other comments from the audience on this project? Uh, I just wanted to be able to uh, introduce ourselves, Paula and Bill Eben, and we're the owners there of the property. And just wanted to thank all the commissioners for your comments and your advice, and Amy in particular for her input and suggestions and recommending uh, the, the NOI. Bill and I, you know, just want to make sure that we acknowledge I'm a lifelong Massachusetts resident. We're both passionate about Cape Cod, and we understand the importance of any project on the Cape is a deep respect for the environment, for the community, and for our neighbors. And so we've been working many, many months, uh, making sure as we've gone through the notice with Don and the team, working with intention to make sure that we were listening, that we did make various adjustments along the way at each step so that the project would be successful, but also so that it would reflect the kind of thoughtfulness with which we approached this. We do want to fix and mitigate those problem areas at the site that Don articulated so well uh, to ensure that our neighbors would be pleased with the way that we were going to go about it. And as you just pointed out, to improve our corner of Witchmere Harbor, which I think uh, that is a good point that this would actually improve the, the entire section there across from our property. So the other, the only other things that I did want to point out was we, having been approved by the Waterways Commission and the Harbor Master, who didn't see any navigational issues, was important to us for obvious reasons. And we also took into consideration some of what the commission is looking to do in the future in terms of dredging beyond three feet and making the dock higher uh, than previous designs. So we just wanted to thank Amy for all of her input and recommendations with this and uh, hope that um, people will see that the plan will improve this area for everyone. Yeah, and just to add some color to that, obviously we, we listened um, pretty aggressively, obviously last, uh, it was in November, December, about the proposed bylaw changes that are coming up in the annual meeting. And I think, Don, you could probably add some color to it, to, to how we're really taking those recommendations, even though they haven't, you know, haven't passed yet, but they're going to town meeting and that's incorporated into our plan. Could you add some color to that, Don? Sure, through the chair, um, but that was Bill Evan. Thank yes, you, Bill and Paula. Um, it's been really good to work with them because they are conscientious. They, they wanted to be on the hearing tonight to at least let you know where their heart is with the project. Um, having said that, Bill is, is uh, right on point that um, the, the, <laughs> the color he's asking me to paint. <laughs> um, 
I think the, the, the documents that we submitted kind of show that um, in the long run, uh, like they did with Allen Harbor, I think the town should foresee that they want to do that to all of their harbors at some point. I know they maintain Sacquatucket pretty well, but Weechmere's kind of been a forgotten harbor and uh, it is a kettle hole and it does have issues at the edges where it seems that the silting is taking place because it's a natural phenomena of kettle holes that as time goes on, as detritus accumulates on the edge, that edge starts to build out. And if you don't address it, you end up like um, Ellis Harbor up in Plymouth where there's not a harbor anymore. And that used to be a thriving lobster fisherman's port. It's all a, you know, it's an, it's an upland marsh now. Um, not that that's a bad thing. It is an evolution, but I think because Weechmere and, excuse me, Allen Harbor and all the channels that the town has makes it a, a, one of the most sought after boating communities on the Cape. And that, that's, you know, I know we don't want to talk about dollars, but that's a, that's a livelihood that really, and a resource that should be protected as well as the environment. So it's really hard to balance all that. But I think we've done a pretty good job with this area of Weechmere Harbor. And I think over time, the harbor could be made even better with more um, people trying to, you know, dredge their areas in front of their docks to keep that sediment from creeping out towards the center of the harbor. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the, from the public? Any other comments from commissioners? Thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to loop back to the, the variance issue. I, I think, um, you know, we've got three provisions in our bylaws that are not being met by this project, and, and that's concerning to me. And we were vetting these issues with the last hearing, and then it was withdrawn, so we're starting over again. Um, I don't know why we wouldn't do all we could to try to improve that the, the source problem with the pipe. Um, it's not necessarily the proponent's problem. It's not their pipe. But I think three variances um, would require significant environmental benefits to overcome those, to allow those variances to occur. So for me, um, you, you've, if you're going to fix that pipe without any type of retention to water quality issues, gas, or sediment, then it, it's, you're not doing much. Salt marsh is not going to remove much from that type of drainage. So. Um, you know, splash pad is not going to remove much at all. So I, I would really like to see a sincere effort to reach out. I know contacts with Mass DOT. Um, I, I, I could assist if that was something that people wanted. Um, I, I would think they would want to fix this and maybe it wouldn't even be the responsibility of the opponent. But for me, I, I can't just ignore those three variances. And I, I really feel I'm disappointed that a shellfish survey wasn't reconducted like I requested. I, I really feel that March 14th, 2020 shellfish survey was insufficient to portray the conditions that are there. And so th those are my concerns. Um, I, I think, you know, a single variance, you know, we can talk about that, but there's three, there's three items in our bylaws that have to be overcome. So I, I would like to see more time to try to have some significant mitigation of that pipe instead of just fixing the, the end of the pipe. I, I, I question, though, whether delaying approval of this in the interest of trying to fix this problem, which obviously doesn't have a, a clear solution to it, certainly a clear source for a solution, um, is, is worthwhile. Um, it seems to me that if this lot is is or this project is approved, the lot is improved, the corner of the harbor is improved, then it would sort of drive interest in making that that issue address or trying to address that issue more so than just leaving it as it is right now, where essentially that pipe is hidden. Nobody cares about it for the most part, other than it appears the Evans. Um, and you know, we'll we'll get a little more motivation to get that fixed than we have right now. Yeah, I appreciate where you're coming from. I, I just think um, that view is overlooking our written regulations in three cases. 
So I, I, I just don't support giving variances to those three items without significant mitigation. Yeah, yeah um, Mr. Chairman, I think to some extent I agree with your comments that this project in itself will improve what exists today. But I have a concern that's at least related to Brad's concerns that uh, the basic problem with that pipe is a state problem. And without some involvement from the state, I don't see that there's going to be a long-term fix to this situation. Therefore, I would like to see some involvement from the state, both the state DOT and from DEP. And I think, you know, if the, the consultant had mentioned that they have potentially some route to get into the state agencies, I would like to see that at least proceed before we take action on this uh, application. Would you like to address those concerns? Yeah, through the chair, I, did, I didn't hear the end of his comment. Um, sorry for the background again. Um, can, can I repeat? Maybe, maybe somebody should mute. Um, but what was the last part that he said about the consultant having an in? I, I just think, so I can be clear. I, I think you had mentioned that you may have some methodology or contacts or something where you can contact either DOT or DEP to try to get them to focus on this issue. And that my final comment was I would like to see that pursued prior to our taking action on this application. Okay, through the chair, that's the part I wasn't sure. So the only avenue that the evidence have is Someone's got to mute their mic. It's really bad. Is it James Richard? I think he should mute. It's, um, it's hard to talk. I'll try to muddle through it as I can. Sorry, um, we can't control it on this end. Maybe if our yeah. um, eight, our channel 18 director can mute that person, that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so the only avenue the Evans have because it's not their pipe, it is an easement, is through the process of something that can't take place until after you approve this. And that would be a chapter 91 route and a 401 water quality route for disposal of the material that I could make aware to the agencies that there's an issue that is unrelated to our project, but related to the county and the state dumping direct discharge with contaminants into a harbor that is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts control. Um, I can't make that uh, pitch now only because I, I'm a consultant. I have to unfortunately get paid for my work. So, but I find it interesting that Brad has made a couple of comments about the pipe. Amy's concerned about the pipe. And I think the town has more weight than a consultant that's working for someone that's adjacent to the issue that's willing to work and maybe even contribute in some fashion. But shouldn't the town also, because it's dumping into the harbor, take some responsibility, not for the error that's made by the state, but by contacting like Amy has. And I would think that because of, and I'm not trying to point fingers, Brad, so don't take it the wrong way, but. You've been around a long time and you've contacted a lot of people and know a lot of people at the state and division marine fisheries level. You should make some phone calls, man. I'm serious because it's it's destroying the harbor and it's it's it doesn't look like it is because it's gradual. But I think the Evans, having noticed this and have stepped forward as homeowners that only are adjacent to and are subject to an easement that some state agency took years ago, can't be their full responsibility and it shouldn't be held up uh, in, at this level to flush that out. I don't, I don't know that that's the proper method to go. If you let this go through, then you're gonna have, have me contacting people on the state level because I have to do that anyway. And the Evans will be paying me as their consultant to do that. But 
to hold this up so that they have to pay me to go do that, then where's the town stepping in? So maybe we could make this a concerted effort because we're all concerned about it. Um, maybe, maybe Brad and I, during the chapter 91 process, could talk to some of the state people that should be, you know, doing something about it. Sorry, I'm my passion's coming through. Continue. I'm, I'm more than happy to continue trying and not just with, with DOT. I mean, we do know people at DP. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to continue trying to do it because yeah. regardless of this project, it's the right thing to do for the harbor, so. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, from my point of view, I don't, it, whether it's the town or the consultant or whoever, I just feel that the state needs to be brought into this because the pipe is really a state problem. It's not your problem, it's a state problem. And so the state needs to be brought in and I would like to see that occur before we take action on this application. But, but to their credit, if we didn't have this proposal in front of us, I don't think anybody would be giving any interest or, or attention to this pipe. And so that may be true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And through, I, the, through the chair. Yeah. One more time, I'm not, I don't mean to belabor it, but I think it's important, through the chair. I totally agree with your comments. I, I, there's no question. You're not giving us the opportunity to contact the state by not by delaying this. You're kind of forcing us to do that, which I think the Evans have shown they're willing to do it. But yeah. how about throwing us a ball in our way, give us their approval, then we go the next level of approval of permitting through three different agencies that will be able to make it known that this is an issue they need to deal with. I I would also argue that if this was were an improved part of the of the harbor front, the harborscape, um, the outflow from that pipe would have more of an impact, arguably, if you do go to the state, than if it's in its current state as it is today, just completely unimproved, hidden, you know, nobody's seeing the impact from it sort of thing. I'd like to say I think Don made some really good comments and uh, very rational comments. It just, I, I have to think of how do I rectify, you know, three variances on this project. And, and the pipe is kind of the way to get there because that's a level of environmental improvement that would allow three variances. In the absence of the pipe, you know, I, I have trouble supporting this. You know, the, the pipe is a, is a way to get there. Um, so every commissioner has to look at our regulations, read them, understand them and, and accept whether they can give those variances on this project. And just to be clear too, with respect to the three variances, it's the setback, mm -hmm. it's the dredging. Does it, it, the project doesn't achieve the 2.5 feet at mean low water. Without dredging. Without dredging. Right, and the third one? Shelter. 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 All right. All right. Uh, through, the through the chair, uh, this is Glenn Wood, counsel for the Evans. I just would like to respond that I think that there's a wealth of evidence as to why the variances are already entirely worthy. On the, on the setbacks, the harbor master has already approved the revised design. He's in charge of navigation, the commission isn't. And as one commission member already said, we should listen to John Rendon. Secondly, the waterways committee has approved this revised design as well. So they've already both determined that the distances to the adjacent docks will not pose a navigational effect. So the findings there, there's nothing more that needs to be done. There's a there's an utterly total and undisputed evidence as to why that variance should be granted. In terms of shellfish, the evidence is abundantly clear that where the dock usage is, where the boat usage is, where the prop wash issue is, which is the major issue with docks, it's black and oxic mud, as uh, your shellfish constable has already again testified. So the full evidence is where the dock is proposed, there's gonna be no adverse impact on shellfish. Even if there's some amount of soft shell clams in the near shore environment, we're bridging over that area. The dock will have zero adverse effect on shellfish habitat. We've satisfied that, evident, that variance entirely in the record and on the evidence. There's, no, it, there's nothing in the record, there's no evidence to suggest that the dock as proposed will adversely impact 
shellfish habitat, especially in the outside where there's no quahog habitat because it's black and oxic mud. And in terms of the dredging, we're improving the black and oxic mud just as you just approved increased dredging in black and oxic mud in the past application for Higgins. So with all due respect, I feel that there is already a wealth of information that's undisputed completely as to why all three variances should be allowed. Further, I'd point out that your administrator has fully recommended approval with the variances. So I think we should be prepared. The commission has more than enough information to vote on the evidence this evening. And if some individual commission member can't get there, uh, then so be it. But um, to put us in charge of trying to figure out a state problem that the town has failed to deal with for decades is not our client's fault. That's on the town, not on our client. And we shouldn't be heard for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to be clear on one point here, which is uh, you, Councillor Wood's statement that since the harbor master has said there's no navigation problem with uh, variances on the dock spacing, that there's no dispute that it isn't a problem. Those regulations are in in. Uh, under our purview, and it's not just a navigation problem. It is an issue with environmental degradation associated with crowding of docks and vessels and all the issues that have been pointed out repeatedly on this commission with docks. So I, I really do not want to let that particular point go uh, undisputed because it is very clearly a disputable point on your part, I'm afraid. And I would respectfully answer. disagree with you. The uh, regulation is entirely vague. It doesn't speak to why the, the setback is required um, at all. And the commission has basically in the past dealt with this issue um, uh, on an issue of setback. So I don't know why I've got a feedback here, but I, I would disagree with that point. Well, I don't agree with you, and I don't want to let the point stand undisputed. I, I, and I think I'm not the only one on the commission who has that point of view. Yeah, I, I, I disagree with that comment as well, coming from Mr. Woods. I mean, take a look at Google Earth Maps and look at this harbor in August in any, any year that you can find an image. And the density of boats is remarkable. And so um, it's a concern. It, it's way beyond just a navigational concern. And the purview rests with this commission. It doesn't rest with the harbor master on ruling, giving a variance on that bylaw. So it, it's, you know, the harbor master has one job. We have another job. It's pretty simple. In terms of I would, I would uh, through the chair, I would expect that then the commission's failing to listen to your shellfish constable and your administrator as well. Thank you. That, that's fine. I, I, again, I was chair when I requested a second sur shellfish survey and it wasn't accomplished. The survey of record of March 4th, 2020 is an insufficient survey. It missed a lot. So um, th that's a concern. There are shellfish there. And so we have to look at our regulations and decide how we should issue a variance or not. So, you know, you can talk about anoxic mud all you want. There's still shellfish present in that area that was not documented by the survey. And so, Brad, the reason why we didn't do a shellfish survey through the chair, I'm sorry, is because we decided that doing another quantitative analysis like your, you know, ad hoc digging with no, with no protocol is not the way to do it. You look at what the substrate is. The point is, is that even if there's some minor legitimate near shore substrate for soft shells, that's not the impact that it's out there. It's out where the wash is, where the boat is, and where the rock wash is. It's all mud, and there's no quads. Yeah, I, I'm confused by your comment on my sampling because th that was done. I do that with every dock and pier project to learn about what's going on there. And if this commission wants to have a second <coughs> survey done for a project, that should be done. 
and I don't know why it wasn't. Um, well, I would just, I would through the chair, I would just point out that your surveys, even though we've requested copies of them, haven't been provided and are not in the record. And so no one's seen them. All right. And I, I, so okay, it's I, just your personal opinion, but there's no data, there's no evidence. So there's nothing in the record. It's just your personal testimony. All right, I, 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 I think no, we, no, I, I, I'd like to follow up on this. I, I requested to have those documents put into the record, Amy. Whatever I got from you, I have given. So, and I can double check on that. I try to be very good about sharing of all information. So whatever, whatever I was provided, I, I've tried to give it. So I, can I can't say that right now because I can't see what I've sent to people right this second. But um, if there was anything, I, I did give it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure this is Pam here to, through the chair. I'm sure that the, the applicant would be agreeable to putting a shellfish survey before and perhaps after in something that can be discussed in the order of conditions. Dan, you had a comment? Nothing. Is it just becoming a back and forth? No. Yeah, yeah, that's what I I'm afraid it's... of. So, so let me ask if there are any other comments um, aside from what we've discussed so far? Hearing none, um, I would ask that we have a motion on this, on the notice of intent that's before us right now. Well, hearing none, let me let me make a motion then. I would move that we approve the notice of intent for zero snow in road, map 15, parcel N 8-B for proposed pier ramp float and dredging. <coughs> Do we have a second? Second. Any comment, discussion? Amy? Um, just in regards to my comment on the uh, width do you wish to keep it as presented or reduce to four feet, which is pretty much our standard practice? Right. And also, are there conditions in regards to shellfish um, mitigation, which is we usually do um, we usually do thirty bushels a year for three years for a new dock for for a new dock for a new dock of this size a new dock. All right. Would that be agreeable to the applicants? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Right. So I'd um, uh, amend the motion to reduce the overall width of the dock and all uh, the walkway so that it's no wider than four feet for its entire length and that the applicants provide 30 bushels per year for three years of shellfish seed um, to be distributed per natural resources. Is that acceptable for your yes. second? Yes. Second, okay. So, any other discussion? Uh, one remark. I, I look at this as an opportunity to be at the, the beginning of correcting a much larger problem. I understand all the remarks that have been passed and the concerns, but I think we have to start somewhere, and I think this is an excellent starting point. Thank you, Mark. All right, we'll take a vote then. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Four in favor, all opposed? No. Three. The motion carries. Thank you for all your input. And we, we hope to hear more from you with your work for the DEP and and DPW uh, on that outflow post. I will certainly take this up with Yevon and with Amy as well. I'll help Thank you. however I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next item on the agenda is a notice of intent for 23 Mill Road, Map 15, parcel U4 32, proposed access steps, elevated walkway, and Vista management. Um, when you're speaking, you 
So actually, I should tell the commissioners this too. When you're speaking, you're allowed to take this down. It makes it easier for people to understand you. This off to the side and that should I feel like everybody needs a break after that, but <laughs> <laughs> you've been another day at the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have been at it now for two and a half hours, so somebody needs to pee, right? I don't need it. No, we're, we're good, Mark. <laughs> I needed to. Um, so um, my name's, can, should I start? Please. Did you, you announced it already? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, so my name's Mark Ellis. I'm the, the home owner at 23 Mill Road. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet with some of you earlier today who visited, but I will repeat what I, I said at that time so everybody, everybody can get a little bit of uh, history on this. Um, so our house is the smaller guest house to a much larger house um, that came up for sale, I think, for the first time since 1950-something. The people bought the larger house and did not want to buy the second, the smaller house, and we were lucky enough to buy that house. It's absolutely, for anybody who's visited, absolutely paradise. It's uh, got the most amazing view, and um, my wife and I plan to retire there. So we're, we're very, very uh, grateful for being able to do that. Um, a special part of that property is this little beach. Um, if you go down to that beach, it's supremely calm. You can look into the water and see the fish. You can observe the marsh. It's absolutely wonderful. I have grandkids and older parents, and so we really want to make, we really want to be able to enjoy that, that little beach. Um, and so we wanted to find a, a safe and straightforward way of getting there. And so um, in consultation with Mark, he, um, he said that we would be able to put this walkway. We um, wanted to design it in a way that was least obtrusive, Followed all the rules and was in fact the minimum we could do to get to the get to this this lovely beach. Uh, Amy came out and saw it. Uh, she was most helpful, extremely helpful, in talking about it and also um, how we might want to change the plantings uh, to ensure that we did you know we did things in the right way. Um, the, you know, it's difficult to see now if you've been out there, um, and so we. Uh, took her advice. We hired Wilkinson, um, Katrine uh, came and did some more work for us, which you see. And I think we have a what we feel is a really good proposal now that will allow us to really enjoy this. Um, and so I'll pass it over to Mark to talk through the. Okay. Um, so for the record, Mark Burgess of Shorefront Consulting. Um, I guess if I can take this down, that's good because it sounds muffled. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so we, we approach this from looking at your bylaws and uh, trying to figure out what's the minimum that we could do to get from point A to point B. And if you've been out to the site, it's clear that there is no direct way to get to this beach. You can walk over the marsh, but then you have to jump over a ditch. And the ditch spans all the way to their property line and then, then, and then circumferences this little patch of beach. So th there's no way to get, there literally is no way to get there um, on their property. If somebody was to drag something across the marsh, that's bad. Foot traffic in the marsh would be bad. Um, if they miss the jump and fall in the ditch, well, that's really bad. So the, the project is proposed for um, access and safe access. And so just a little bit about the design. You've seen the plans. Um, I know you know your bylaws uh, significantly in this regard. So where four feet of width is allowed, uh, Mr. Ellis has gone to three feet. That allowed us to keep the walkway at a, at a lower height, but also respect your up-and-coming new bylaw. So the, the height of the walkway is not one-to-one. -one, it's one-and-a-half-to-one, which is in accordance with the proposed change of your new bylaw. So not only are we respecting the existing bylaw, but the proposed change, whether it gets incorporated or not, uh, Mr. Ellis is also respecting that portion of your bylaws. The, um, so it's three feet wide. And we need two at-grade steps. If you went out to the site, those steps are beyond the existing split rail fence. So it's just two at-grade steps to get down to the, the elevation of the walkway. 
and then the walkway extends out over the marsh, over the ditch, and then it is a 10-foot ramp that starts at the outer edge of the marsh and lands on the back side of the beach. So this doesn't go into the water, it doesn't go into any shellfish area, it doesn't even go on the other side of the beach. It goes on the landward side of the beach. It's the quintessential definition of an elevated walkway, which is to span from an upland area over a marsh or a lower area to up to a higher area at the end. Um, some walkways don't do that, but uh, this one uh, does exactly that. Uh, we had gone through, or in, before we entered the design process, we'd gone through Amy and waterways, and because it wasn't uh, considered a structure that went into the waterway or into a shellfish area, there was no shellfish survey required. Uh, there also, waterways review was, not, was also not required. So that's why you'll see that absent from the application. And um, I want to point out that the, what marsh there is in the title range, I know in my narrative I said an inch. I was close. I looked at the plan today, and the title range from the lowest point of the marsh elevation that I can find on the section line to mean high water is 0.05 feet, which corresponds to six-tenths of an inch. So that's all the tidal flow that you have out there. It's almost on high. The whole walkway is almost entirely above mean high water. Now even the ditch is only 9.6 inches. So regardless, we're not talking about minimal to zero tidal flow. And even so, we're talking about tidal flow at the upper edge of the flow where it's slow. It's not in the three hour range where the tide's rushing in or rushing out. We're way above that where it's just creeping up, stop, and then just creep back for six-tenths of an inch, you know, like that much. So very little tidal flow here. Um, we, I, I did submit an, a, an additional letter that explained in regards to the bylaws, depending on how they're interpreted, that if the piece of marsh that each, each of the pilings occupies, which is a total of 1.6 square feet, that marsh can be transplanted. So there is absolutely no loss of marsh, no matter how you look at this. And um, I made the spans, I, I, in my sense of symmetry, I like to make the spans even, but they had to be 19 and 17 because I had to literally start at the ditch and work my way out to get to the ends. And, and a 19-foot span would have put a pile in the ditch, and a 17-foot span would have put too many pilings, so this is the minimum amount of pilings. There's only three in the marsh uh, to gain the access from one to the other. In addition, the deck spacing is already at three quarters of an inch. Your current bylaw is a half, so we're respecting that future bylaw as well with uh, three quarters of an inch of, of spacing for shading. So the, the walkway is designed well exceeds your regulations for um, width and height and, um, and, and spacing for, to, to exceed any of the uh, uh, anticipated effects from, from shading. Um, there is mitigation proposed uh, of 75 square feet of marsh in the, in the marsh area, in the fringe marsh itself, but uh, I'll let Katrin uh, explain the rest of the mitigation, but there's a wealth of, of mitigation involved with, for the project in accordance with the bylaws. Uh, there's some wonderful areas that are going to be left natural to redevelop the, the Sassafras area and things like that, some really special, cool areas on, on the site. So it's I'll let them explain, but it, it, I think it's really wonderful. Um, lastly, I'm not going to go into this detail, believe me. I'm, the narrative is long because I went into a long explanation of how bylaws can be interpreted. And I don't, I don't want to get into the explanation. That's why I took the time to write everything down. But it was valuable for me to go through the bylaws one by one and see what the options were as to how we interpret the bylaws, uh, because it can be tricky sometimes, especially if the bylaws aren't aren't as clear as they're about to be. So that was the reason for doing it. I, I'm not going to present it. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to read it and was able to digest it. And that was for the benefit of everybody here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katrin. Thank you. Good evening. For the record, Katrine Higgins from Wilkinson Ecological Design. So we submitted a, a restoration plan and a land management plan that hopefully you have in front of you. And really what our goal was uh, uh, for both plans and our the entire proposal is, is to establish a restored and enhanced vegetated buffer 
and that's focused, the, the way to do that is to remove the invasive species that are existing there now and also to plant areas currently unvegetated and that's all in an effort to provide improved habitat for wildlife on this property. And then if you read our, our land management plan in more detail, we provide some ideas for a new, manage, uh, new management approach for the existing tree species which have been historically managed by a previous owner um, over many years. So just to talk about the existing conditions a bit, in terms of the coastal bank, there's a matrix of non-native and invasive species along the whole bank. We're really focused on the area seaward of the existing split rail fence. And that you know made sense to us because it's closest to the fragile resource area. And it would be, it'd be most beneficial to really enhance that area over anything else. So as I mentioned, there's previously managed oaks, black cherry, and sassafras on this um, bank, also uh, two service berry. Um, and so it's clear that these plants have been managed for height for, as I mentioned, for a very long time. And as a result, you can see that in particular, the oaks are growing in this kind of awkward, unnatural form. And in particular, there's that one oak where there's two, one or two branches that are really extending in this kind of awkward way out over the salt marsh. And it's shading entirely the salt marsh in one area. It's about 300 square feet in size. And so that there's nothing growing in that area. And I think the best way to take a look at that is on our, in our land management plan on page two, that bottom quarter, you can see that there's salt marsh growing really healthy in all areas besides just right under this oak tree um, where the elevation hasn't changed or anything and, and it's clear that there really should be salt marsh growing there if it had a little bit more sun so overall you know when you move up kind of upland and kind of go in a higher elevation from that you can on an, underneath those existing tree species you can see that the plants growing in that area consists primarily of non-native and invasive plant species, especially garlic mustard, privet, vine honeysuckle, brambles, and bittersweet. There's little baby privets that are just trying to take advantage of, um, of what's going on in this area. And so it's clear that this, this, this area lacks a healthy native shrub or ground layer. It's just the invasives that are kind of coming in and taking over. And so that's really why we thought this made sense in terms of mitigation to focus on this area and improve the ground layer and the shrub layer that should be growing there. And then when you go down towards the salt marsh and into the salt marsh, it's a really healthy, besides that bare area that I mentioned, there's a, a really healthy salt marsh community with some high tide bush ringing the upper marsh and salt marsh hay and salt marsh cord grass growing at lower elevations. And then, so when you look at that's you know, the existing conditions, and then when you consider what we propose to do, you can see on our, our restoration pr plan, we're proposing to remove all the non-native and invasive species. It's it, within 3,000 square feet. Um, we would primarily do this by hand because the access is tight and it's a fragile area. And our land management plan also described our approach to tree management. We spent a fair amount, very many hours on this property reviewing each tree in detail, considering its health and its proximity to how it's growing close or farther away from other tree species. And there, in total, there's 12 historically managed trees on the bank, um, excluding the sassafras grove. That's, um, as Mark mentioned, it's kind of growing on the southwestern property line. And that's a really healthy area of um, sassafras, which we propose to release in order to become a viable colony of sassafras. And then as we show on our restoration plan, we're proposing to remove four previously managed oaks due to their poor health, extremely poor health, and they're over, being overcrowded right now. Um, we propose to flush cut four previously managed oaks, one cherry and two service berry, and allow them to regrow in a more of a natural shrub-like form. And that, the way we're proposing coppicing, what we call coppicing, it's defined on page seven of our land management plan if you wanted to know more details about that. It's essentially just trying to grow the tree in a, a shrub-like form and it has all the benefits of a, of a tree species 
um, but it's a good way to, to an appropriate way to deal with some of these trees that have been managed for such a long time and, and you know, topped for such a long time. It's a better, a better way to create some more biomass than what's currently shown on, on, the, on these trees currently. Um, and then the largest, most significant tree that's been historically managed is that oak that I mentioned that is extending down into the salt marsh. And we really didn't want to do anything to that tree because it's the largest tree. Um, it had been historically managed, and then that's why the, those branches are extending into the salt marsh. So we're just proposing to prune in a selective way that would maintain the tree, but allow light to, to get into that salt, that bare area of the salt marsh so we could plant that with salt marsh species and allow that area to, to regrow like it should be um, a salt marsh plant community. Overall, we feel that this kind of targeted approach between coppicing, pruning, and selective tree removal will benefit the long-term health of the salt marsh by increasing the sunlight that I just mentioned. And, and also, it will, this work will allow us to establish an appropriate native grass cover, a grass layer, and shrub layer along the bank that's currently not existing. And this work will also reduce the, the amount of annual maintenance needed on, on the bank. So once this initial work takes place, the removal takes place, we propose to plant uh, according to the plant specifications on our plan. And you can see on our plan, we're proposing pitch pine tree, bayberry, sweet pepper bush, rose, and a lot of marsh elder, the Iva frucescens, which um, really would be along that the edge of the salt marsh uh, and provi it will provide a dense vegetated buffer landward of the salt marsh, which is really key in flood flood control and storm damage protection. We also, like I mentioned, we're proposing to plant in that bare area, the 300 square feet that's underneath the, that oak. And we would probably like to, to blanket that with erosion control blanketing to hold and then plug into that probably after the spring, in the spring after the winter storms, which would provide those species um, the best chance of surviving after the storms take place and, and um, that erosion control would really just help kind of hold those plugs in place with any kind of wave or tide action. And so as I mentioned, this work spans over 3,000 square feet of the property with invasive removal and that includes the 300 square feet of planting in, in a bare area with bare soils currently. And this is all in an effort to, to serve as mitigation for the proposed construction act activities, and it definitely will provide improved habitat for wildlife and also improve stormwater function for the property. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. As with Mark, yeah. I was I neglected to show you the materials of the walkway. So I know you're familiar with the pylons. This is a 10-inch pylon. I know you're familiar with that. Now, if you would presume for a minute that this is a walkway, the pylon goes in first, then an I-beam spans it. And then on top of that I-beam, on, on each side is a C-channel here and here, and then another, another one of these I-beams running the length. So you need the I-beam for the rigidity for, because of the long spans. But I, you, I, you, know, I, you can pass these around. They're, they're lightweight, they're inert, it's a composite fiberglass material, so it never, never rots. We put it together with stainless steel, Literally, is set it and forget it. You never have to worry about it again. If, you, if anybody's interested. Okay. I'll take them. Thank you. <laughs> Amy, wants Amy, wants Amy, wants Amy wants them. Amy wants them. I'd like to see it. Amy wants them. Okay. I've probably never seen these before. I, I have two see them like when they're yeah. in, but I don't, yeah. Yeah, I have two more things in chat here. Like right. Don't forget to, do to take stands. them back from me. Yeah, we tried to do these stands in, in wood be really, really heavy. Okay. So that's all. Good, thank you. Sure. Amy? Um, okay, quick, how do I want to approach, which side do I want to approach first? Um, I guess I'll start with, I'll work from the top down, from, from the banking down. Um, I met with Mark and Mark um, on the site first, and um, Mark explained that his him and his wife really wanted a couple of things. They wanted to be able to, of course, maintain their, their beautiful view 
that um, they have up in the harbor and also wish to create some access to um, a coastal beach area farther out. So um, being the plant person that I am, first looked at um, what you wanted to prune. And just simply, the, the whole idea at, at first was really just to kind of prune what was there. And like, but um, I'm, I'm glad that um, you're, you see that there might be a better way to do that. Um, initially, it might be a little bit more. But in the long run, it's better for the bank, which is better for protection for your property. Um, it's better stability. It's certainly better environmentally. So. I think um, the methodology that Katrine has come up with from Wilkinson of selectively full removing of a couple of trees, coppicing a few others, so they actually, instead of becoming what's, what's now basically just really heavy, dense, shrubby canopy with no understory other than a few invasives that are making it, um, you know, a dent, more of a dense shrub that actually will m reach maturity and fruit um, like an oak tree should. Um, and then supplement that with the other plantings, um, mostly shrubs. There was a pitch pine here, and I, I do like that the um, sassafras grove on the south side is continue is going to be allowed to just do would do what it wants essentially, um, with the ex exception of you know if there's any re sprouts coming up in your lawn area. I know you want to take care of those. Um, the oaks have created a, such a dense canopy that, as Katrina said, they are shading out near shore portions of the marsh. And that's just because they kept topping them, so the, the poor trees just kept trying to grow out wherever they could get some light. So um, now moving on towards the walkway. The walkway also for a new structure in a resource area usually we would see this this is a walkway it's not it's not a dock so normally with a dock we would look at shellfish mitigation that didn't make sense here just said you know you're required to do at least four to one mitigation for a structure in a resource area so they were already proposing to do a little marsh restoration and they brought wilkinson in to come up with the other piece of things so just to crunch the numbers for you um, the total structure is 88 by 3, which equals 264 square feet. Mitigation would have to equal at least 1,056 square feet. Um, what they're proposing in total is about 3,000 square feet of, of work. And fully, I mean, I made them aware that, you know, purely removing invasives and, and planting natives isn't always seen as you know, a one-to-one -one mitigation for things. So that's, I, I think, the the biggest um, bolster for this is that 300 square feet of marsh that I, I have no doubt once the shading is removed and you plant it, that it will will regrow. Um, so I think I think the slope planting and the marsh planting is is appropriate and and should do very well. The walkway in and of itself, I don't know if you got a chance to see the Division of Marine Fisheries letter about, the, yeah, the height. the height. So, I mean, our requirement is a, is a height ratio of one to one. They exceed that. Um, Mark um, Burgess has the height at one and a half to one with the one and a half being the height to the decking. The Division of Marine Fisheries suggests a height to the bottom most structural member of the, which would be below the decking. So potentially the structure would have to be a little bit higher. Nine inches. So. Nine inches higher. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that is really to help with light penetration. They agree with the orientation of the dock. Question came up on site today about potentially starting, not the dock, sorry, walkway from kind of where your seating area is at the top of the slope, but that would make it so it's not perpendicular to the waterway. Um, could make it more susceptible for storm damage and stuff like that. Um, not, so I do think, I mean, with that there will be some minor level of shading, regardless of height and deck spacing, but and I don't think anybody's saying that there, there wouldn't be any. I'm not too worried about pile scouring for this project because as you stated and as you can see on the site, the tide range in this portion of marsh is extremely minuscule. Um, there's even, I mean, there's some portions that are above, some that are below. So you're, as far as like tidal flow and current going through here, 
you don't see a whole, a whole heck of a lot. Um, my, my biggest concern with the project is the coastal beach area, which I kind of went back and forth about, is this a coastal beach, is this a dune? What is exactly this landform? Um, and originally I was thinking of having our coastal processing specialist um, see if he could come out to the site, but I don't think we're there just yet because upon reading the regulations, um, it's, it wouldn't be a coastal dune because a coastal dune is something landward of a coastal beach. You don't have, you can't have a coastal dune without having a coastal beach. So this is the seaward landform between the channel or marsh the, that first sea word landform is a coastal beach. So I, I'm 99% sure that we could consider this coastal beach. So that being said, um, it is surrounded by Salt Marsh, which is a sensitive community. My concern is not now, but my concern is, you know, with, with future use out there that edges of marshes, you know, that areas that are sensitive might get disturbed, not the, not the sandy area in and of itself. Um, so I would just want some sort of, I don't, I don't know how we could prevent that from, that from happening. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you have the best intentions of, of this area and letting it stay how it is, but just as we know over time, um, things tend to change. So if there was a way that we could say that, you know, human activity could not alter that, that sensitive edge of marsh slash coastal beach area, I'd be interested in it. Um, I do think, I mean, in your alternatives analysis, I think could be a little bit stronger in term, we talked about it on the phone, Mark, but um, you'd mentioned kind of this Illumidoc option and you said that the materials themselves are about the same cost as the structure. This would be something that would literally cantilever over and have no pilings except for something to fix it at the end. At each, at each end, right? Yeah, right, uh, at the ends. But it was not preferred because of cost and aesthetics. And I don't know if that, you know, aesthetics have, are not our purview. Um, thankfully, we don't like telling people what's good looking in that. That's a slippery slope. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to get there. But um, I, I think the alternatives analysis could just be beefed up a little bit, potentially there. So I'm not, I'm not ready to make a recommendation yet, I'm sorry, to the board, because I, f I feel like I need a little bit more assurances about that coastal beach area not having enhanced human alteration. Um, and I am a little more interested in a little bit more fully vetting of the alternatives. So again, don't take it in a bad way, but I'm not fully ready to make a judgment on this. There's breaking news, so I can, I can um, elaborate on that. Yes, thanks. I was able to get a hold of two marine contractors, and they both have pretty large cranes. Neither one of them, okay, so I asked Illumidoc, first of all, how much does this thing weigh? It would have to be shipped to the site on a barge, because there's no way you're going to even get a truck down this street. It would have to be shipped via the barge. Um, at presently, I don't even know if a barge large enough exists that a crane large enough to span 4,000 pounds over 100 feet. That's what it would be. The, the walkway is going to weigh at least 4,000 pounds. And if I look on the plan, I measured from the edge of the water, not where the crane would be in the center, but the edge of the water, the beach, to the center of the walkway, and it's just over 100 feet. So both of the contractors that I know don't have that equipment. Um, is it around? Perhaps. But I asked them, I said, just assume that your current barge could do it, which is like 30 feet wide. That blocks a lot of the waterway, um, and it's probably $25,000 extra to do it. So it, it and, and just the fact whether or not aesthetics isn't in your purview, the thing's going to be ugly, and, and it just, it's not, that's why I put it in there as an alternative to say that it's not a desired alternative. It is a way to meet the bylaw letter for letter, as I was describing, but I think it's a, I think it's a horrible alternative for those, for those reasons. And it may or, and, yeah, it um, may, or may not be viable. It may, uh, I don't even, right, so at this point, I don't know if it can be it done. Been vetted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the other thing was, as far as managing the outside of the beach, um, I don't think there's a problem with a condition that says that the site can be monitored. Not that you need y y every year pictures, but 
if some, if there was a, if there was a co condition that says that if, if it's determined that human activity is causing degradation of the fringe marsh around the beach, then that has to be addressed. And that could be an ongoing condition. It can survive in a certificate of compliance. So that way you have the opportunity that if something's noticed and if it's proven to be um, pedestrian or, or human interference, you have you maintain the right to address it. And I think that's a, a, a decent way to accomplish that part too. Yes, yes, yes. Do I have to touch the chair? No, they're through the chair. Yeah. Through the chair. Um, so Amy, I think they're great points. The the yeah the Illumidoc, I kept saying to Mark, don't even even put it in. I mean, you're talking about this with the ugly dog. I don't quite understand why we have a bylaw for walkways if you can't have piers to hold the walkway. So so I think the assumption was that there's got to be something there to support it. The only thing you get out of the Illumidoc is you take those, I don't know what you said, f three feet, because it probably shades more than what we're proposing. So. I just think, if you really want me to do it, I'll put this huge aluminum thing in. It's, I, I, I just don't see how that would be good for anybody. Um, on the, on the, the, I mean, we love that little beach. It's, you're right, it's very, it, it, it is surrounded by marsh. Um, and I'm happy to stipulate, because we're not going to go out there with hundreds of people. You know, we're just going to, as a family, be able to use it. That's, that's. And it, it, it's really just you sit out there. It's the it's the calmest, most beautiful thing. So, um, I appreciate what you're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. So that that would be my answer to that. Thanks, Amy. All right. Let's get comments from the commissioners. Alan, you want to start off? I just had a question. The entrance to the harbor is that considered a river, or is that just a harbor inlet? Because Andrews River flows south into that. It's not a river until it gets up closer to, um, that's considered just the harbor itself. It doesn't turn into a river until you get to near Brax and then towards the Harbor Master's Workshop on the other side, where it narrows, essentially. Yep. So it's not classified as a river. It's not as classified as a river. Right. Do you have any questions? Uh, well, the only comment I have is I think that the suggestion that uh, that Mark made about ongoing monitoring and being able to do something about it if we did notice there was degradation of the adjacent marshland to that beach, I think that might address Amy's concern, which I think is a very valid concern. Yeah, fr frankly, if we degraded it, we destroy the beauty of it, frankly. Like, the last thing we want to do actually is degrade it, if you think about it. We're not renting this beach so people can run out there. It, 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 it's that is the beauty of it. So happy, very happy to do that. Yeah. And so that's the only comment I have. Thank you. Brad. Yeah, I've got a few comments. No issues with the Vista view management. I think that's really well put together. Um, in terms of the walkway, I, I have a number of concerns with it. Um, I, I just think you know if you look at our bylaws. Chapter 304-7, any structure proposed for siting in a marsh or in a body of water adjacent to a salt marsh shall not destroy any portion of the salt marsh or its substratum, nor have any adverse impacts on the productivity of the marsh. Um, so this would need a variance. Um, this structure will impact the marsh. It, it's unavoidable. Um, so I, I just, I have great concerns over putting a structure over that salt marsh um, for these purposes. I, I think Amy's comments on the coastal bank are also really, or the coastal beach are also really important. This will lead to more impact on the coastal beach. There's just, there's no avoiding it. Um, you, you would hate to impact that resource. You don't want to impact that resource. The human activity will impact that resource. Um, so for me, I, I don't think the justification of, of having these impacts is, um, justifies the variance to our bylaw. Um, also a little concerned about coastal bank impacts. They might be able to be mitigated, that's possible. But uh, either, either way, it's, it's more activity, it, there's more impacts on the salt marsh that would not be there. Uh, so I, I don't support that piece of this project. Can I just address that? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna use the beach. We're gonna walk across the marsh. We're probably gonna legally put a bridge because we have to to get over the walkway. So your proposal is we should damage the marsh 
to use our beach instead of following the bylaws. Nobody in their right mind is saying that you have a standard for a walkway that has no piers. It, 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 it's just the bylaw wasn't written very clearly. No, nobody, nobody here, I, I doubt anybody here thinks you should build a walkway with no piers. So, Brad, with all due respect, there is no variance and, and, and you, you, no you're variance. changing the rules to try and stop anybody building anything and it's just, it's too much, it's you too much for me. Are you suggesting there would not be a variance to no, our bylaws? No, variance. no variance. Yeah, so I, I disagree with that. That's fine. In, in a bridge, I don't know why that would be a viable solution. I don't know why we'd approve a bridge um, over to this area, so. Because the bylaws allow it. Excuse me? The bylaws, the bylaws allow you to have walkways. This is a walkway. Right. That's but, why the bylaw's there. But it does not allow any impacts to the resource. And there are none. No, I disagree. They're, posi they're positive. We're you, putting in extra grass. You, We're you, moving it. There's, no, there's, no, there's none. There's none. You cannot avoid them. It's, it's, so it's, the state of Massachusetts says there's none, and you say there is? For this particular project. I'm just speaking about okay. this particular project. Yeah, and every other one. We're so I, with, with due respect, if the, I've sat on one of these boards in due respect, not for this. But the job of the board is to ensure that the bylaws are being followed, not to make up the bylaws. And with due respect, Brad, you're making up the bylaws to, for your own efforts here. And I'm, and I'm I can read it again if you'd like me to. It's, yeah, yeah. It's very clear. It's, no, it isn't clear. Oh, it is. That's the problem. It isn't clear. No adverse impacts. Yeah. Well, I, I So think walking across the marsh is, is going to be less impactful? That, that's a very temporary process that, that uh, people have done forever, and those, those activities come and go where structure is permanent. Okay. We've, we've had this argument at, at infinitum. Yep. Um, let's, let's I disagree on. with the fact that walking over the marsh creates a permanent path of permanent damage. It impacts the sediments. You, you can't convince me otherwise. It, there's no way that a, pa that a path is a worse alternative than is a better alternative than, than what's proposed. It's the seasonal activity that occurs. But the marsh, if you're using it while the marsh is trying to grow, and the only time you're not using it is when the marsh is dormant, it doesn't grow back. Yeah, I, I disagree. And When's it going to grow, Brad? And this, this if people use their properties from <laughs> April to October, that's when salt marsh is active. Right. If they're, if they're using it and damaging it and creating a path, then when does the marsh get a chance to regenerate? It doesn't. How many actual uh, trips would you expect would occur in a season? Enough to bend the grass over and cause permanent damage. It doesn't take long. Yeah, Just the, the trips to build a walkway will create a temporary impact. And once you're not doing any, any walking around in the marsh to build the walkway, it restores in a year. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I, I think it's an agreement to disagree here. We're, we're not going to yeah, agree on this one. No, we're not going to agree. But I, yeah. It just seems absurd that walking through the marsh is better than this. It just doesn't make I, sense. I think it's absurd you're suggesting the structure would not cause an impact. I didn't say it wouldn't cause an impact. Uh, oh. yeah. can, can we move Are you all set? Yeah. Okay, John. Yeah, I don't uh, have anything to add. I think that's all been said. All right, Stan? Well, I have two questions. One is with the beach. Um, does that change over time with the marsh there? Was that one little patch there in you know, can it move? Is it really yeah. a beach? Um, I do believe it is a beach, um, as defined under the Wellness Protection Act. Um, but yes, I mean, wetland resource areas are not stagnant. Any re wetland resource area can change. So edge of marsh could change. That beach could get smaller because, um, well, the beach will only get smaller if the marsh got bigger. The marsh is only going to get bigger if there's enough elevation, if there's, it's at the very specific elevation. Um, so on its own, I mean, weather events can change, right. change things too. I mean, this elevation right. is so low, like the little beach area is only maybe a foot if so, or so higher than the surrounding marsh area, a foot or two. So if we get a hurricane, that beach could get wiped out. Um, it's so things are, it is a dynamic area. Um, my, and I'm not saying what I'm saying is it shouldn't human activity um, should be just so that it there should it shouldn't be altered due to human activity. No, I understand, that's but yeah. but it, rising sea levels are going to affect that. Absolutely, whole area. Mm -hmm. eventually, yep. That whole area can be affected. Correct. 
and now with the walkway out there, that could, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, what I'm thinking here, could it be impacted by any of these events? I mean, just like any, any dock structure, I mean, that in, in, the, in a weather event or any of these events, those Well, no, I'm be thinking of the, 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 the beach area itself. That could become marsh if it, if, if. It could. Well, I mean, but whose resource areas change, any resource right. area can change. Yeah, it's connected to a big, it's the, I'm, you I'm, see I'm one just, piece. I'm just speaking is, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I understand what the, you're saying. The second question I have is, where is the actual property line for that house? Is that in the marsh? Does it go out to right out to the yep. right out to the edge of the water? Yep. No, I'm just asking. Mark. That's per the deed. Yeah. Here's, here's the end of the walkway. The no, that line. wasn't my question. What is the property line on the pro, on the property Water's records? Line? Oh, it goes beyond the beach. Goes into the water, right? Well, okay. So the surve when the surveyor comes up with this plan, he draws the property lines per the plan of record. So here's the edge of the marsh right here. The property extends seaward of that. And this is called a tie line. So don't worry about that. that that's not a line that's on it. It might be on the plan of record, but in any rate, here's the Well, that's not line. showing on here. I mean, unless I'm missing it, that this doesn't show the property line. So my question. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, you're looking at Wilkerson's plan. But yeah, that's the property line. It's it, on Wilkinson's plan. It's a okay. Dark, dark well, line. that was just my question. Oh, I just okay. wanted I to confirm. Which plan you were looking at. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, so it actually goes into the channel, basically. Yeah. Yeah. You should and go visit. It's a beautiful little beach. There's, it's it's bigger than you think, and it's uh, it is. I, I'm done with my question. So, so. Uh, Mark. Uh, the land management plan I have no issue with at all um, and to uh, to the issue of the, the walk to me it is a far better alternative than the continued usage and degradation of the property so I would support the issue okay thank you um, my question might be somewhat related to Brad's, I think it is, but I'll present it in a different fashion. Um, less than two months ago, we had a similar uh, proposal put before us on another property in town uh, for a walkway over a marsh, and we denied it. And the reason, one of the reasons for the denial was that the proposal would have an adverse impact to an existing salt marsh in that it provided two 12-inch pilings in the salt marsh and it would lead to a loss of the salt marsh biomass from installation and, and shading. So explain to us, if you would, how is this different from that proposal? Okay, um, fair question. So first of all, it came to me, which is why I, I gave you the second letter, it came to me that if I literally, if I interpret the bylaw literally, not liberally, <laughs> if I interpret it literally and say, well, there should be no loss of marsh, then we, we knew that the piling as it went in, that little section that it, in circumference would be lost. Well, I said, well, geez, you don't have to do that. Take that marsh out and transplant it. So in actually, if you want to interpret it word for word, there's no loss of marsh, therefore meeting the bylaw. If, if your regulations require a certain height for shading impacts and a certain width and things like that, and we meet and exceed that, you have to assume that if those are the standards set by the bylaws and we're exceeding them, those standards are set in order to avoid negative impacts. So you can't therefore go against your own bylaws and say, well, there's gonna be impacts. The standard has been set by your bylaws as to to uh, determine an acceptable level of impact, whatever that is. Maybe it isn't zero, okay, agreed. But your bylaws are established to to establish a level, a standard of, of impact. The project meets and exceeds that respectfully. So I don't see how the board can say that it has negative impacts. That's like saying you can have something and then say, well, no, you can't. 
the standard is set. We meet the standards. It's as simple as that. Yeah, to address the chair, if you look across my property to the property across the way, there's a walk. Actually, it's a. I think it's a dock. It, it's a walkway, and there is salt marsh all around it, and the salt marsh all around it. There's no degradation. So, if you want to go see, there's no degradation. Just go to the property across from me, and you'll see there's no degradation. Okay. Cool. So, so that was the one difference. The other difference between that project and this project is that they actually have no pedestrian access at this point without jumping over that ditch, which is, you know, it's unsafe. Non, even further to the fact that breaking off the edge of the marsh, if you miss, you know, you're going to fill in the ditch, you're going to break off the peat. Okay, that's bad, obviously. But they, the, the real difference is they actually don't have the ability to walk over that marsh to get to the other side. Okay, I don't see that as a differentiator, really. Because the other, the other project, they did have the ability to, to walk and contiguously through the marsh, but well, they do not have the ability to do that. Suggesting they could put a bridge that. over the river, and that would be fine too. But so I'm not going to go there with that. Yeah, no. Marsh. If we, if you tell us, we can, we can build a stairway to go down onto the marsh, and we can build a bridge to go over the, the ditch. Ditch. I'd do that. Well, it still has to be pile supported. So yeah. in that line of thinking, it wouldn't work. I, I, no, I don't I think, think it would. On the I think last we, we project as well, it was proposed that the salt marsh that was um, impacted by the pilings would be replanted somewhere else. Yeah, it would so be. I don't see what your that your argument necessarily is any different from what you was presented at the last proposal. Well, the only okay. So the only difference was we never determined what we do with the marsh that was inside the piling. So technically word for word, literal, def literal interpretation, when you put the piling in, that, that marsh that's inside the piling would, would be destroyed. But it's not destroyed if you take it out and transplant it. That's in addition to the mitigation. I didn't think about that then. It just dawned on me that that is a way to meet the bylaw. Yeah, I don't know if they were able to add like 300 feet of marsh. We're adding yeah. 300 feet of marsh. Yeah. yeah. John? <coughs> so I'd like to point out, Mark, yeah. that at that last, um, uh, yeah, the last case that, that Ernie uh, pointed out, um, both you and the attorney involved uh, repeatedly quoted that bylaw, but there are two parts to the language in the bylaw, and you guys always focused only on the first part, which says there shall be no loss of salt marsh. But there's another clause there which says also that there shall be no degradation in the productivity of the salt marsh. And I think that's the thing that we focused on because you never never proved that point. And, and in the debate, it was always the first point, which is a little bit of misdirection in my opinion. We have to focus on both those points. And the second point is a much more difficult point to address because it's very difficult for you to prove that there, in fact, will be no loss in the productivity of the salt marsh. And that is, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, that's the basis of reservations that members of the Conservation Commission have about these things, is we cannot establish uh, in any concrete fashion that there, in fact, shall be no loss in productivity of the salt marsh. Fair enough. Um, we're, prov we're increasing the, the vegetated buffer, so couldn't you say that by providing a stronger vegetated buffer, we're protecting the salt mar marsh from stormwater runoff and allowing the stormwater runoff to go into the, in, in, you know, the grasses that we'll be planting will go into the, the stormwater runoff will immediately go into the soil rather than running down into the salt marsh. And by doing that, you're, you're going to enhance the salt marsh. And in, and in, uh, tru in truth, you, you can't prove it does damage the salt marsh, right? Because if you go across to the property, which I welcome you to do, go across the other side to the, and you'll see it there, and it's all sprouting, it's all perfect. I, I don't know how okay, it degrades. Well, so excuse me if I may yeah. rebut the point with not wanting to get into just an endless back and forth here, but A, that's just an anecdote. It's a single case. It doesn't prove anything. And second, it is your burden to prove that you're not degrading the productivity of the salt marsh. It's not our burden to prove 
that you are. That, that is the way this works. So if we have reservations because we're concerned about degradation of the environment, we can act on those reservations. And you may think that because the guys across the street or across the water don't appear to have a problem, that's hardly sufficient proof that there is no degradation here or there is no concern about degradation. And, and, and if you look at some of the evidence Brad has presented, he's presented pretty clear evidence of degradation of salt marsh in a lot of cases. So it's, it's really difficult to come to the conclusion uh, that we don't have a potential problem here. Understood, but why do you have regulations that govern the height and the width if, if, if like, aren't your regulations actually, like, shouldn't you just say you can't have any walkways? Because that appears what you're saying is, you just can't have any walkways. Right, because the, the, the pylon isn't doing the damage. You're saying it's the whole walkway. Well, right. why do you have it a certain height? I, I don't know anything about this. I'm just a straightforward guy who to wants, to, wants to have us follow the rules, and, and, ha and if there's a pile off of walkways, then obviously there's a reason for it. And so... We're trying to minimize impacts, so those, those, reg you know, those regulations make sense. Um, but at the same time, we're not supposed to impact the salt marsh or the productivity of the salt marsh. So it really comes down to shading, scouring, and for me often construction impacts that don't heal. Th those are really the big three for salt marsh. And uh, so that, that's, those are things we have to look at closely with every individual project. Okay, so we know the construction, through the chair, we know the construction impacts are temporary. Um, and there's conditions that could be put in place that if marsh doesn't regenerate fully in, in you know three years or whatever you can go ahead and plant under under the board boardwalk no problem that that I'm not worried about that that's that's easy can I ask um, yeah how, how do you know that Is based because on evidence or where does that come from? because the the numerous elevated walkways that I've permitted and had installed were a substitute for existing paths and a year later the path had completely regenerated Plus, I can show you, I can show you plenty of pictures of all these projects where while the walkway was being uh, constructed, um, like, like the dock on Chase Street, there are temporary impacts. And in one season, the marsh is nearly grown back 100%. It may take two seasons, but there are temporary impacts that, that the marsh regenerates all on its own. Uh, that's easy to document. So you have a lot more experience than I do on just walkways. Mm -hmm. For example, you referenced the 10 Chase Street. I, I disagree with you. I, if you go there in the off season, the scars are still there. If you go there right now, there's enough plant material that it may look like things are okay, but that construction scar is still there. So it's, it's not healed in one season. And if there's shading on top of that, it may not heal. And so in the Herring River, you see those impacts persist throughout. A little different situation because of scouring. Yeah. But, yeah. but shading, scouring, construction impacts are real. And those are things we have to look at. And then the fourth thing I think is coastal bank impacts, which in this case, it sounds like it can be mitigated. Okay. So help me understand something. If, if you have the two bylaws that tell you how to design these structures in resource areas, as far as the height, the width, the plank spacing, Assuming that you follow those guidelines, then isn't it contradictory to the intent of the regulation to turn around and say, well, now these pilings are gonna cause damage or the walkway is gonna cause shading. I mean, the dimensions are specifically to avoid negative impacts, specifically regards to shading, height to width ratio. That's what it's all about. Minimize so impacts. if those, minimize. So if those impacts, if those standards are in your regulations, isn't Shouldn't you be able, from a designer or, or an applicant or even, even a, a conservation commission uh, member, shouldn't you be able to assume that if you meet that standard that everything's okay? It would be contradictory of that standard to say, well, you did that, but, but now there's still gonna be this. The regulation doesn't say that. The regulation's in place so that you can do this work, not so that you can't. And so to, set a standard and then all of a sudden say, well, it doesn't meet that standard. That, it's contradictory. It's, it has to go, it goes back to what I was saying in my narrative about how do you interpret these regulations? If they're really well written, 
these discussions don't exist. But we know that, that the, the town has struggled with the regulations and you're trying to improve them and I applaud that, I was part of that process. But if you interpret them word for word or in a, in a you step back and say, okay, what are we really trying to do here? What is the intent you know, to have this structure be allowed but do it in such a manner that doesn't um, significantly neg negatively impact the resource area? That's not necessarily written. Some towns do that. You, you guys aren't, the, the regulations that they stand are not that specific. So to step back and look at the intent in, in the spirit of cooperation as far as how a board works together so that these projects can be approved, you know, you step back and look at the spirit of the regulation. To interpret it word for word, literally this and that, it just bats you into a corner and sends you down an endless rabbit hole. And that's not the way the process is supposed to work. So respectfully, bylaws should be interpreted in their, in their intent. And sometimes, like I said in my narrative, you have a 65 foot setback, that's pretty clear. But when you talk about impacts and shading and, and things like that, these are all a little nebulous that, that are difficult to prove on both sides. So while you can challenge us, and that it's our burden of proof, what I'm saying is that the regulations allow this work to be done, and they've set a standard, and we've met that standard. So in that respect, there's no argument. Actually, we've exceeded it, right? Because yeah. we've gone to what you want. Yeah. If I can rebut that a little, like I think if you're talking about shading, you, we've got dimensions that are supposed to resolve shading impacts. And so, yes, um, you would like to think that's the case, but you're, that's only one impact. So the other impacts are not as clearly defined. So. So how do we meet them if they're not clearly defined? How do we clearly meet them, Brad? I, I think what's, what's happening to me is I, I'm seeing the knowledge of some of these impacts just in the last few decades starting to come clear. And so that's driving some of my approach to this, is that I'm seeing the impacts that we were supposed to avoid with these regulations, the Wellness Protection Act was supposed to avoid 30 years ago. Wow. With time, we're seeing these impacts starting to show. So. We're making progress. I think the cooperative effort to improve the shading uh, re requirements have mm -hmm. really will make a big difference if we can get those finally approved. So we're, we're making, you know, we're making strides. But I also think that, you know, we're on different sides of the table, Mark. And so your, your job is very different from ours. And so, you know, you're making these appeals, but we have to review these these bylaws and these regulations in the Wellness Protection Act. And and I see that we should be avoiding any impacts at all. And the encroachment that's been occurring recently is causing impacts. So it's tough. It's, it's tough for you to hear this, but we, we have very different jobs. I know our jobs are different, but we should be working together. And the, reg the regulations, if they aren't clear enough to make that assessment, then yes, change the regulations. And, and that's part of what you're doing. I get it. We're exceeding the current standard. Yeah, just, hey, Brad. Brad. I think you're a very decent, and I, 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 I admire your, what you want, what you're trying to do. I, I do. I, I'm not, I, I think you do have different views. You have a very strong view with a very strong opinion that you see you've seen for decades that perhaps the rest of us haven't seen. And, and so I'm just trying to be in a town where I'm a resident like you, and I want to be treated fairly within the rules, and if you look at what we're doing, I think we, you may disagree, but we're talking about tiny amounts of what could be uh, the marsh not going quite as much. Because if, if you, are you agreeing that the changes in the height and everything is actually reducing the effect of anything with the shading? I'm not exactly sure what we're talking about after that. If we are talking about the two piles, we're putting in 300 feet. So, I, I think we're making it better. I think we're making it much better, which is what we want to do. We're not, I'm not here to destroy them. This is not, I'm just, it's just not what we're here for. We just want to get a, enjoy a piece of our property that we can't get to otherwise. Well, I understand. Well, we can, I, I, but it, it makes a lot of sense for you to have those interests. I mean, I, I respect that, but you know, the 1.5 1, 1. to one ratio, we have a very good study recently that shows that um, there are still impacts with that. So, you know, we, we try to change things and improve things, but it, it doesn't eliminate shading impacts at 1.5 to 1. 
Agreed, but that's not what your bylaw says. That's what both sides have to abide by, is your bylaw. But if you go to 1.5 to 1, are you almost still going to keep denying all of them on the basis that it could impact? Like if you change the bylaw, right, and I come along and I have go to the new bylaw, and I come with the same proposal, in your view, you still deny it because you, so why did you change the bylaw? Because still not going to work, it's still not, it's not solving your issue, is it? Well, I guess we're not, I'm not being very clear that it's, it's, it's not just shaded. There are, there are several sources of impacts that will degrade, in my opinion, the productivity of the salt marsh. Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned that it's up, it's our responsibility to write, give you clear bylaws to follow, but I would argue, too, that that it's your responsibility to learn from your experience as far as these hearings are concerned. Mm -hmm. So the one that I referenced before that was denied, um, I, I see the same issues coming up again in this one. So I, I don't think you've addressed the concerns that we had with that last proposal. Um, I mean, it's essentially the same kind of a structure that you're putting in front of us today. So. I think it's your responsibility to come to use your experience, Mark, mm -hmm. and come back to us with something, either a, a better explanation for how this is different, other than just saying you're taking this hunk of salt marsh and putting it over here so it's not disturbed. I, I don't buy that. I mean, I, it's, that's, that's a, a good I happen to listen to that. Wasn't that, didn't that have a no, dock at the end I of finish? it and things? Sorry, sorry, I'm close. Yeah. So what I'd like to see you do is, is go back to that project, take the comments that have been given tonight, um, and obviously we're not gonna make a decision on this tonight anyhow, right? Because we're still waiting for, no, is this waiting. one that we needed to continue? No. Oh, that nope. would have been DMF okay. maybe, but no, we have No, we, we have something from DMF. We, we do have a enforcement matter to deal with after this, so it's not, we have other stuff we have to deal with tonight. Yeah. Uh, but I would suggest you come back to us with alternate proposals or a better explanation of how this is dissimilar to what we have already m given a, a opinions on. Just well, it's also six inches. Ago. It's also six inches narrower. So we t we did take I did take those. That's why we didn't. That's why so, we waited. To so what it. you're putting in front of us now is what you want us to vote on. Is that right? Not tonight. If not, if it's going to go this way, no. No. So of course not. Should should. Okay. But, Mark, work but with remember, Amy to come up with what you feel. I don't see that we're making any headway yeah. one way or the other as far as the presentation that you're presenting to us now. So I mean, what would you like us to do? Well, obviously, we'll need to continue to take a look at it. Um, but One issue I could offer is maybe a little more information on uh, minimizing construction impacts. On the what? Construction minimizing impacts. construction impacts. Okay, so That's a, a protocol. A better, a better plan. It, it's not, right now I don't think you know how that's going to go. Oh, I do. Well, you, it's, I've you, done, <laughs> no, I don't have to say it, but I'm saying I've, I've, I've had permitted and built tons of these. So well, I thought you said earlier you weren't sure about the barge in, in the crane. Oh, no, I don't know about that, but I, okay. I still think that's an absurd option. I just didn't. Well, it, 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 knowing that we can minimize construction impacts is one issue I think we could learn more about. Well, I could look into it lo a little further, yeah. But, but Brad, are you saying how we construct it to minimize the effect? Is that? Th that's one of the impacts I see okay. from these projects. Construction impacts that linger, you know, Mark suggested they're very temporary. Um, in some locations they, they linger and then it's cumulative with the shading, with the scouring, construction impacts, bank, more human traffic. All of a sudden you, you have uh, scars that don't heal. So in the salt marsh. So that that's <coughs> something that that I think about. It's not just the one feature on minimizing shading. And then I'm very loyal to this language that says there should be no loss of productivity. So and, and I feel like I'm seeing in this town losses of productivity in places because of these structures. So what, what part of the bylaw, if the bylaw is, is in regards to height and spacing and all of that, wouldn't that be addressing productivity? Why wouldn't it? I mean, why, why else have that bylaw? Why, it, else, why else be that specific? It does. It's about it, the marsh. It, it's shading. It does. Yeah, it, so it, if you meet that standard, Brad, how do you it, say that it doesn't? I don't know how I can be any clearer. It's, it's, I, I spelled out four categories of impact. That's one category of impact. 
that doesn't exist because it's designed in accordance with the standard. There's no pile scouring because there's a six tenths of an inch of tidal flow and yeah, there's, no, not, there's no sediment. We're, we're not going to get anywhere here. Maybe we can work with you, Brad, to, to go through your exact concerns and see if we can, in fact, address them or not. I think, Ernest, that's what you asked I, us to I, do. I, I think that's what you need to do at this yeah. point, and I would suggest that you work with Amy on this. Okay. Um, I would I would recommend that you don't have direct dialogue with a particular commissioner. That's not well, he, it has to be. He through, has a lot of knowledge. Okay. Through me. Right. I mean, I'm happy to, but yeah, that it can't you know be direct contact. Yeah, and and I think you're sort of a. I'll be the intermediary. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Good. So, I would recommend we have a m packed agenda. Anyways, next time. Um, that the soonest next would be November 3rd. When do you want it to be? No, I'm going to be on vacation. It's going to have to be after Thanksgiving. Okay. Let me look. Sorry. I don't have the December dates. Yeah. December 1st. Thanksgiving's the 25th. Can I, Mr. Chairman, can I ask for just a clarification? All this discussion, shouldn't we have a, a, a vote first for the continuation before we're actually telling the applicant? I mean, I guess the dialogue, just correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, we can't have dialogue between us. If, if the request is to continue the hearing to a subsequent meeting, then yes, we'll vote on that. A request from us, not from the applicant. No, from us, no. too. So we Both, yes. Yeah. Right. It can come from either side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yes, we are. We are requesting formally requesting that now we're working out what date might work what are, my, what are my choices in December December 1st or the 15th first or 15th All right. um, can I ask one more question or is any other of the members do, do you have anything else that you'd want us to address so we can make sure we cover everything this is these are the items we should address to compare what was permitted was denied before I, I think the yeah the, the yeah. commissioners have given you their feedback so uh, I would start with that okay uh, there, there may well be more issues that come up I don't know what you're going to present in December so Got it. so I can't um, I can't answer that okay I mean, if the commissioners have thoughts after this meeting that you would like me to convey to the applicant I'm happy to do so that would be very helpful yes and if there's ways that our mitigation plan could be adjusted to be to benefit the overall project, please let us know. So December first or the fifteenth, what's your pleasure? If it's December first, then materials have to be in by the day before th Thanksgiving. Well, we have a half day, so it would be the Tuesday of um, the week of the week of Thanksgiving. Which would be the 23rd? The what? 23rd. November 23rd. Yeah, I'm going to. Make it later so he doesn't no, perfect I can't you. do that either. Yeah, make I'm, it later. It's going to have to be the 15th. I'm going to be, I'm not going to be back until just before Thanksgiving, okay. so I wouldn't have time to, to do All right. anything. 15th. Yeah. Sounds hey. like a nice vacation. It's been a long time. I'm driving around the country visiting friends and family. So how long does it take to drive 8,000 miles? <laughs> a long, a long time. time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And we have a motion then to? I'll, I'll move to continue. Um, I'll move to continue uh, 23 Mill Road, map 15, parcel U4-32 until December 15. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Oh, did, you didn't ask for public comment, right? Excuse me? You didn't ask for public comment, but I don't know if anybody's left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably on our next, about our next thing. I'm sure they would have spoken up, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Good Thank, you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Right. Mr. Chairman, um, since we, before we do certs of compliance, can we jump to Discussion and possible vote for an update on 42 or 52 and 47 North Road. Yes, please. Um, Mr. Smith, I don't know if you are present. Uh, I see a few people. Uh, yeah. 
Hi, Tom. Hi, I'm here, Amy. I'm still awake. <laughs> we are too. Yeah, I can see that. So, um, if it's if it's good, I'd like to just update the commission real quick and then give you a chance to speak. Okay, uh, I'm in front of you tonight just to address the uh, enforcement order regarding these properties, 47 and 52 North Road. I would like to request a little more time to address the order. Um, I Just to give you a little background in the whole thing, I, I hired um, Ryder and Wilcox about six months ago to try and redo the septic system to the back part of my property. And I was hoping to take 47 and move it to 52 on that septic system. I've just recently decided I'm not even gonna proceed with that because it just takes too long. They, they're just too backlogged and too busy. And it's hard to get you know anybody to, to, uh, to proceed with what they need to dealt with all the work they have. So um, I decided to bring it back to the original situation where we put the mounted system in front of the house, but I would like to bring 47 over to 52 on the septic system. And I, I got positive feedback from Board of Health on that just verbally, and I'm hoping that we can make that happen within a few, I, Stephanie told me within like three weeks, she should be able to have something together. And then I can address that whole issue. And when I address that issue, I'll do the septic system and take the machine that I have there and take out the driveway at 47 and do some of the stuff you need me to do at 47 to comply with your enforcement order. Um, also, I, I took out the um, shower totally. I, not only the head, I just cut it off at the house. That's gone now. Um, and I would like to keep certain things in the enforcement order if I could, but just to address the other issues, the septic and, and um, that's what I that's what I'm trying to do. I've hired a um, I've hired an environmental consultant to work with me on this to uh, hopefully put together some mitigation that you guys are comfortable with. Um, I know Amy that that you had some correspondence with him, but it was he he wasn't able to get to me until this early this week, and I know you couldn't meet with him because you were busy, and I totally understand that. But I'm hoping that he can be at the next meeting as well as. Ryder Wilcox and possibly my attorney just to go through the process and, and work this whole nightmare out for me. And that's, that's where I'm at tonight. I'm hoping that I can get some time to work with you to make everybody happy in this situation. Okay, thank you. And that's, um, that's where I stand. Okay. Just uh, so the commission knows, the original enforcement went out at the beginning of August. Um, it's been two months, and only a shower head has only the shower has been disconnected. Um, I did. Um, you you did already give Mr. Smith a extension to finish this work, the, um, or at least to get started. Um, I mentioned numerous times to Mr. Smith to make a good faith effort to start coming more into compliance prior to this meeting tonight. And I know you have a lot of other things going on, but I, I, I do feel this should take a lot of precedent um, because especially at 47, I do find that the activities are, are fairly egregious against the Wellness Protection Act and Riverfront um, at Rivers Act in particular. Um, in terms of your how it relates to your septic, I understand you may want to wait until you are um, you have a machine available. But all that septic work, I mean, the septic work has for 52. Um, you know that was supposed to have happened a very long time ago, um, and actually, you know that permit with the Board of Health for one of your septics did lapse. 
Um, so I, unfortunately, I, I mean, I understand your, your rationale, but we don't know what, I mean, Ryder Wilcox says a few weeks, how do we know it's gonna be a few weeks? Because those changes also have to be approved. The Conservation Commission approved your plan for the septics at each of the properties, but if those are changing, then the conservation, not only the Board of Health, but the Conservation Commission has to approve those changes to your septic systems. Um, to no, I, and I understand that, Amy. I um, I talked to Stephanie, and she she wrote me a letter explaining her situation and how behind she is, and and how she's trying to you know do it as fast as possible. But obviously, the conditions are such that you know she can't get to certain things because of you know being able to hire help and get people to do things and like everybody else mm -hmm. um she um she said that she uh, when i said look just abandon the plan to bring the septic system to the back side of the property i wanted to take it further away from the river and get it away from the property um and then all the resource areas that are negative but she said well, I got to I, I got to have a survey and all kinds of other stuff. I said, let's just abandon that and we'll go with the original one. All I want to do is take 47 and move it to 52. So we have to basically take a two bedroom and move it to a three bedroom, which she doesn't need a survey crew because she already has the specs on that. So she can do it a lot quicker. And as soon as she gives me the approval, if she gives me a plan, I'll take it to the Board of Health, which I, I think I have to do before you. Is that correct? No, you come to us first. Okay, so I'll take it to you first and, and get hopefully your approval and then take it to them and get their approval. And then I will address all of those issues that we have to do. Uh, I have to obviously, if, if if I get what I would like to do, which is take the cesspool out of 47 and not put a tight tank in there and move it to across the street where it's further away from the river and better for everyone, I think, um, I will obviously dig up that whole area and then restore it to whatever you want. And, you know, while I need to bring in a machine at that point, take the cesspool out, pump it out, take it out, and then pump it across the street. Right. Um, and, and the same goes for where I have the stone now on the other side where I prepped out for the septic system. That would be obviously totally redone because that's where the mounted septic system would go. Mr. Smith, I have to ask you a question. So there, was okay. seven, there were seven violations at 47 one of them Correct. have been addressed and it sounds yep. like you're conditioning all the rest of them on getting permission to move your septic system well not all of them but but probably four or five of them because why, why is that? that but well because that's where they want a tight tank was approved at 47. i don't want a tight tank there i don't think the septic system there makes any sense that I think you no need impact. to move it across the street. So that if if we do that, we have to take up the septic system, which is where the where I put stone right now, which was a driveway before. I want to take that out. Obviously, I have to bring in a machine, take it out. When I do that, I'll bring it back Mr. to Chairman, point of order here. Yeah, a question. Point of order. Amy was in the middle of giving her analysis of the situation. I think Mr. Smith needs to let Amy complete her discussion, and then we Thank can get you. on to the next step. Thank you. Go ahead. Please, let's move on. It's late. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you. What I was just going to really say is that I think that the violations are mutually exclusive from the septic system. Whether or not you can get a, mach you know, you. a machine in... You know, I, I, I have it on good authority that you own a, com a construction company. Um, so a machine, you know, we shouldn't have to wait for a machine to come in. There's a lot of activities. Um, you know, the bulkhead, we had uh, the deck in the back, um, the fenced-in area. Um, all of these things don't necessarily um, pertain to the septic system. So I do think both the issues, uh, the septic is mutually exclusive from the violations on both of the properties. And um, 
so my recommendation in short is that this property is still in severe violation of the Rivers Act of um, the state. Also 52 of that gravel area was supposed to have been removed by f September 14th, which I did remind you of on the site um, and is still there on 52. So in short, and you can appeal this and the directions to do so, will you have 21 days to do it, is to continue to find you. 21, 21 days from when, Amy? When it is issued. And if I may Which finish, one? my recommendation to the board is because we, this, we, we need to, I, I feel it needs to be hammered home that these are egregious violations. Um, I may, it may seem on a small scale because it is a small property, but it is, they are large violations. And because the only the shower has been addressed, I would recommend to the Conservation Commission fines starting from September 15th until whenever that gravel is removed for 52. And fines for each, daily, for each of the activities on 47 starting tomorrow until they are resolved or you success or that you appeal the enforcement order and fines. Thank you. So if I understand you correctly, if I appeal it tomorrow, you then I'm not going to be fined. Is that correct? You cannot appeal it tomorrow. You cannot appeal it until I physically issue you the document, which will be next week. Okay. Okay. Got it. I understand that. And once the appeal happens, that is up to um, appeals court to I mean, determine when, if the fines actually do cease or not. But they will continue to accumulate until situations are rectified. Um. Just ask if there are any comments from the commissioners on this. I'll open it up. John? I support Amy's recommendation. Thank you. Mark, you have a puzzled look in your face. I'm torn. Um, the excuse for moving any gravel or stone uh, to me is not adequate. There's been enough time to schedule something to be done, even if there's a backlog. I understand that the engineers are all busy and that every one of them has got a backlog. Um, in my own circumstance, I've waited three and four months. So that's not, you know, that's not unrealistic. But the problem is that this is just not been addressed and too many things have been just let go and assumed it was going to be okay. And I, I, uh, I'm struggling with that. I'm afraid I have to agree with Amy's remarks in general. Thank you. Any other comments? Anyone? So should we have a motion? Or see if there's any other comments from the audience. There are a few people online other than Mr. Smith, so. Okay. Are there any other comments from the public on this issue? All right, hearing none. Uh, can we have a motion, please? Could you, um, if, if you may, before you make a motion, can you have them separate for 52 and 47, please? Excuse me? Can you have separate motions for 52 North and 47 North? All right. So I'll make a motion to impose daily fines of $300 starting on September 15th uh, for the violation at 52 North Road which um, requires removal of gravel to resolve. Uh, you have a second, please? Second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. We have another motion, please. So can we have a discussion first here? Uh, 47. There are six outstanding violations? There are. And are you well, I have not verified it. I will do so immediately. You, you, I would suggest you structure it that if you, if you see fit, 
$300 per day for each of the violations that are found to be still in violation. Each of the As of <coughs> tomorrow, October oh. 7th. Okay, so I'll make a motion to impose daily fines of $300 for each of six outstanding violations that are confirmed to be remaining in violation as of tomorrow, October 8th? October 7th. 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 Oh, tomorrow's the 7th, sorry. Um, at 47 North Road. I'll second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Anything else on this one, Amy? Nothing further. No, okay. Thank you. Uh, should we do the certificate of compliance? Yeah, let's do the certificates. Right. Do you want me to run through them, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Or through it, rather? Yes, please. So we have one request for certificate of compliance for John and Geraldine McGran at 356 Lower County Road. It was for addition of a deck to an existing home. The project was from 1989. Melissa inspected the project and found it to be in compliance. It was a deck. There was no other conditions. Um, like back then, we didn't have, you know, replanting, anything like that. So um, the property is in, in the process of transferring. Um, we would recommend the certificate of compliance for 356 Lower County. Okay, can we have a motion to approve this? I move to approve the certificate of compliance for 356. 356 Lower County Road. Can we have a second, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Um, wanted to give a real, real brief update about the um, presentation to the Board of Selectmen. Brad and Ernie did a fantastic job of making a presentation to the Board of Selectmen regarding the proposed warrant articles. The Selectmen did officially vote to place those warrant articles for water dependent structures and wetlands on the May town meeting warrant. So they didn't, they'll be doing more presentations about, you know, the contents and hoping to get support, but it will be on the warrant. They will be on the warrant. So that was very good. And Any thoughts on any one? We they, they've asked us specific questions on um, making some changes. Yep. Um, they wanted to, in particular, have us consider changing the dates at which we require docs to be out. Mm. That seemed practical. And the the second one was on the um, grandfathering. They were worried about us imposing the, all the new changes to the bylaws to grandfather structures. And that's, I thought, was those two were reasonable requests coming from the board, but we would have to come up with language that I yeah. think we would have to vote on. I think um, in the next couple of weeks, let's, a couple of us try to get, to, like the three of us try to get together and then present it to this group, mm -hmm. um, see it, and then go from there, and then go to the board of select. Those are the two items, I think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll have to look back, but that would be the next process. I'd like to get back in front of them maybe sometime in December, potentially. Yeah. Sounds um, like the next meeting is kind of tight for this. There's no way. No way, yeah. Maybe the one after. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's fairly fairly easy. Yeah, Change. I mean, I think not next week is already planned for me, but maybe the week after we can get together and, and discuss things. Or please feel free on your own, you know, because you're you, – we're – to make a suggestion and out, it's something that we can bring to this board. Um, so if you have time independent, I don't have to be necessarily involved. Yeah, and, so. and I mean, just to clarify too, so there, the, the question they raised was, our current requirements are that the docs be out between uh, October and April, correct? Mm. May. Uh, May. Did you say they may, may f they're in the water May 15 to October 15th. Right. Um, and I think it was Don Howell asked the question of, you know, why should, why is that, why are those dates chosen? They seem somewhat arbitrary, if, especially if people want to go out and boat in March. Yeah, I think they're more concerned with like end of season that 
that October 15 is a little too early potentially because I mean it can be absolutely beautiful day. Yeah. You know, so well, I think even putting them in or not allowing them to be put in in April too is. You know, well, a lot some of, of the stuff is uh, in water work is limited because of winter flounder in some of our right. harbors. Yeah. So it would have to. It might be dependent. So that does raise a question if we want to make a distinction between freshwater and tidal water docks. Correct. I mean, we might have freshwater also but. herring impacts. So. Yeah. Yeah. But something to think about. All right. So all right. anyhow, we'll work on that and get it back to everybody so you can all see it. Yes. Question. Was there any remark from the selectmen regarding the uh, decrease in the size of jurisdiction on any of the uh, wetlands down to a thousand square feet? They questioned it, um, and they seemed comfortable with the with the answer that we gave to them. They didn't render s support or not at this okay. meeting. I think they want to wait, but there yeah, there's concern about the size. Yeah, and, and it was ironic because that came up in a prior presentation. Where there was uh, the there was the wetland on where is that located? Uh, you had just done a survey on it, and identified a thousand square foot wetland. Yeah. And right. you know all of a sudden we're we're proposing that we go from three thousand down to a thousand. So, yeah. you know there was there was some concern there yeah. too. All right. Um, uh, yeah. Minutes. If we can do some minutes, Melissa has been working so hard on them, and I would love for you to to get through a couple of them, and then we can be done. Okay. You just want to go in order. I went through them, and but, you know, like John, I, I thought she did an amazing job. Yeah. I I went through the first three. I didn't get to June 16, and uh -huh. I, I didn't find any issues. Yeah. In the I first three. used this one or two typos, but no. I'll echo that. I I did. Go through June. Oh, 16. please have your things. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you left me with no. These two. These two. That's going to become. That would become like a, um, a bookend for me. So don't leave me with things. Um, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. On the on the June sixteenth one, I, I did have a chance to get through that, Amy, and I just had a couple of questions for you. Uh, on I don't the, have them here in front of me. So, I'll, but, I'll, but make them aloud because Melissa is going to is listening. Okay. Um, on the first page, they, there's a statement, a paragraph, actually a third paragraph under discussion of possible vote, that states simply, Hartford, uh, Harwich Conservation Trust Conservation Partnership Grant Application Seeking State Participation in the 31-Acre Hinkley Pond Herring River Headwaters Presentation Project. It should, presentation sh shouldn't be in there. I think it just should be project. No so presentation at the end. Part of the yeah, there's no presentation in here. It's. Oh, you said presentation project at the very end. Preservation project. Preservation. I'm sorry, preservation project. I mean, it's a statement. It appears to be a statement, but there's no. I don't. Okay. It doesn't make sense to me we'll when have I read it. Melissa yeah, I'll give this that, to you. I'm sure. Yeah, and the other stuff is is there are a couple of typo changes that I noted that I'll, you can just pick them up as you go through this. I think is just a few. I mean, if you have, if you do have a minute, just to email her if, with those, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. But otherwise, if things look good, you could, you could, as long as you name them all, you could do one motion for all of them. Okay. So I'll make a motion. We approve the minutes for March 17th, 2021, April 7th, 2021, April 21st, 2021, and June 16th, 2021. Um, the June 16th. 2021 mo minutes with changes. Yep. You have a second? I second. Thanks, Dan. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All Aye opposed? 16. Me too. Sorry. Two abstentions. Yeah, because we were here oh, today. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Amy, do you want to give the gang a, a quick update on the work we did at Bell's Neck Bogs and, and maybe the next step? That's sure. I'll be extremely brief about this. Um, two weeks ago, a couple of the commissioners. Myself, Melissa, um, and some members of the Harwich Conservation Trust went to the Bell's Neck Bogs and on the northern, not the most northerly bog, but the bog if you drive in to the left, um, removed the, just flush cut, not stump ground or anything, but removed the invasive olive as well as willows, which um, that's a gray willow, that's an invasive willow that we're growing in there. and. That's just the first step for management. 
started to look a little bit um, at the invasives on the edges. Poor John. I, I tasked John with that, and it, it was the thickest poison ivy ever. Did you, you get it, though? I didn't get any poison. Um, <laughs> So it's really it's the invasive management. It's, we're not managing heavily, but it's, we're managing the invasives that come into the bug because that's that's no good for anything. So we'll be working. Um, our AmeriCorps member started this week, Jody Monroe. Um, we'll be working with you know having more work days and more AmeriCorps work days to tackle the bugs on the other side in, for the same things um, for the the willow and the. Um, in the um, olive, and um, I have not heard back from Wilkinson, and I should have regarding a proposal to treat the Phragmites um, and use potentially some wetlands funds to treat the Phragmites, which are kind of sprouting up all over the place, and we'll we'll really take over if we don't do something soon. So I will get on that, but then we can talk more. You know, we can talk more in the future about other management, but I think a good first step is starting to get the invasives in check out there. Do you guys have anything to add? Do the pine trees consider invasive? Mm. Not if it's like a big grove. Or, or, or unless it's like a, a big grove like thicket. Like all the trees on the bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we're all pine trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I thought it was a good start. I, I look forward to getting out there again. I think with the numbers we had, we made some progress. It was good. It was hard work. Yeah. It was kind of a swamp. It was a soupy day too. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. Anyway, it's late. Yeah. Um, I will not be here the next two days. So if you need anything, contact Melissa. My brother's getting married. Oh, yeah. congratulations! Yeah. Yeah. So, but I'll be back. We're off Monday, so we're back Tuesday. Uh, All right. Should we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. That was echoed. Can you all please, there's three things to sign. Uh, no, please do. Take as many as you can carry. Because I'm giving the rest to Amy to leave here.